Council Member Raman. Here. Council Member Blumenfield. Council Member Harris Dawson. Here. Council Member Rodriguez. Here. Council Member Lee Absent. So four members and a quorum, Madam Chair. Okay, great. We have eight items to consider today. <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to run through the items. Item one is an update from LASA about the LA Grand Hotel Demobilization Plan. Item two is reports from the Department of City Planning. There's multiple reports regarding an enforcement analysis of the home sharing ordinance and the development of a centralized enforcement database and platform. Uh, item three is a motion regarding the creation of a department responsible for the development and management of the city's homelessness programs. Item four is the CAO's homelessness emergency declaration third quarterly report. Item five are CAO and LAHD reports regarding um, issuing multifamily housing revenue bonds for a supportive housing project in CD9. Item six is an LAHD report about a disposition and development agreement for uh, the Downtown Women's Center project uh, in CD14, which is very exciting. Item seven is a Municipal Facilities Committee report uh, about a license agreement between the city and Hope the Mission for a Rec and Parks controlled property at 6099 Laurel Canyon Boulevard for the operation of a tiny home village site. And item eight is a report from the housing department regarding uh, executions of a new covenant agreement for the Hillside Villa Apartments in Council District 1. So with that, I, okay, I'm, we, we have so many commenters to get through. We will have to ask for people to be quiet. If you are not quiet, I'm afraid we you will be asked to leave the meeting, so I encourage everyone to be quiet. We have a lot of public commenters today. We're gonna to provide an hour for public comment. We encourage commenters to keep their comments brief um, to the point. And if there's repeat commenters making the same point, we wanna see you in all your glory, but come up here, make your points brief so that we can get through as many people as possible in that hour. We have two translators available, I believe. We have a Spanish language translator and we, I believe, have a Cantonese language translator as well. I want to confirm that we have those translators available. Yes, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate the city clerk's uh, support in ensuring that we had multiple languages available for today. Um, and we have Ms. Cheng from the city attorney's office to give the public some instructions as they provide their public comment. Hello, everyone. Um, to members of the public, when it is your turn to speak, please state the name you signed up under, which of the agenda items you would like to speak on, and whether you would like to provide general public comment. You will have one minute per item, up to two minutes total for items on the agenda, and one minute for general public comment, for a maximum speaking time to, of up to three minutes per person. Please speak on agenda items before per beginning general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up. When speaking on agenda items, you must remain on topic. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you're on topic, you will get one brief warning from me or the committee chair. If you, don't, if you do not immediately get back on topic, or if you stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time and we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna start with a few speakers. Margarita Ruiz, Rosario Hernandez, Alex Harris, and Becca Ayala. Please make your way to the right. The sergeants will help guide you to the podium for your comment, and then you exit that way. So come over here if I've called your name. And I'll call more as we move forward. Please come up to the podium, state your name, the items you're speaking on. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Becca Ayala, item two. Okay, great, you have one minute. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Becca Ayala, and I'm the Policy and Advocacy Director at Better Neighbors LA, a coalition of hosts, tenants, housing activists, and community members focused on preserving long-term housing by curbing illegal short-term rental activity. Better Neighbors supports the recommendations made by planning in the report, specifically the recommendations prohibiting home sharing and ADUs in all properties with NERSO units. 
ADUs and RSO units represent some of the very few forms of affordable housing in LA, and both are at risk due to the continued operation of illegal STRs in these units. Banning the use of ADUs as STRs protects this source of long-term housing, and banning STRs in properties with at least one RSO unit helps keep those buildings affordable to working class communities. We ask you to approve these recommendations and amend the HSO in order to protect long-term residents, including approving Councilmember Blumenfeld's motion for a private right of action and mandatory data sharing agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before we have our next speaker come up, I'm going to invite Councilmember Hernandez to speak. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, colleagues, I'm here to speak on item two on today's agenda, which will, you will be discussing shortly. I want to start off by framing the history of this building and its tenants. Hillside Villa is a 124 unit apartment building in Chinatown. And in 2019, the 30 year affordable housing covenant expired. And soon after, tenants received massive rent increases, as much as 300% in some cases. This building is occupied primarily by low income families, including many seniors who are on fixed incomes. There was simply no way for them to afford these increases. At the same time, we know that Hillside Villa may be a unique situation. Uh, that at the same time, we know that while Hillside Villa may be a unique situation, it is far from an isolated incident. Across the city, we have almost 6,000 units with affordability covenants that are set to expire before 2028. And I don't have to remind anyone that our city is already facing a housing and homelessness crisis that impacts every district. This crisis is fueled in no small part by an eviction to homelessness pipeline that leaves our most vulnerable residents without the safety nets they need to stay housed. Since taking office, my priority has been finding a way to keep the tenants at Hillside Villa housed and ensuring we do not let the tenants at this building fall into that pipeline. What is before you today is a deal negotiated by the housing department with the owner of this building to extend the affordability covenants through 2034. I believe this requires a robust discussion and that the tenants who are the directly impacted parties must have their voices heard on this matter by other council members. So I'm glad that they are here today. As a council member for this area, I have examined this deal thoroughly since receiving it last week and I have personally raised concerns with the housing department and the landlord. Key among them are the current stipulations that would, require rent, uh, that would require back rent payments to be collected right away. While the tenants will have a period of, of six years to pay back the rent owed with an interest rate of up to 3%, it is extremely unlikely that these low-income families will be able to pay the back rent on top of their monthly rent. I am pleased to share that after discussions between myself and the owner of the building, he has agreed to a six-month interest-free extension for the rent debt repayment, and I believe the housing department has updated language to share that will reflect this adjustment. I believe that the city must and can find a way to cure the tenant's debt to ensure that they are not vulnerable to evictions and to keep these tenants in their homes. I appreciate the support of my colleagues and the housing department as we try to come up with solutions to this issue. We cannot lose sight of what is truly at stake in this moment. As a city, it is in our interest to preserve every unit of affordable housing that we have and to protect vulnerable tenants from being displaced from their homes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker, name and the items you're speaking on. Mi nombre es Margarita Ruiz. Estoy aquí para hablar sobre el delito ocho. Ocho, okay. You have one minute. One minute for you. And just pause for the translation. My name is Margarita, and I'm here to speak on point number eight. Estoy aquí porque el dueño está agarrando cinco millones de dólares. Disculpe, señorito, puede comenzar. No, no le escuché bien. Que estoy aquí porque el dueño de Hillside Villa está agarrando cinco millones de dólares. Permítame, señorito, un momento. Sorry. Discúlpeme, no la podía oír, ahora sí. El dueño está agarrando 5 millones de dólares y nosotros, como inquilinos, tenemos que pagar la deuda con el 3% de interés. The, the owner of the building is receiving 5 million dollars and us renters are having to pay 3% interest. Hold on one second. Can we start her time again? Thank you. Go ahead. Eh, y él... No, no está dando garantía en el contrato que está 
ofreciendo, nos puede desalojar cuando él quiera. He's not giving a guarantee in the contract that he's offering. He can um, ask us to move out anytime he wants. Por eso está, estoy aquí para pedirles a ustedes como representantes de la, de la ciudad. That's why I'm here to ask you uh, as representatives of the city. Que nos ayuden a nosotros, que somos personas que vivimos de, de, al día con nuestros salarios. To help us um, as people that we live by the day with our salaries. En, es todo lo que estoy aquí para compartir. Gracias. That's everything I'm here to share. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. And I'll call a couple of other names. Let me start with uh, Keisha Jones, Rabbi Dusty Brown, Fede Ramirez, and Andy C. Go ahead, your name and the items you're speaking on. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Rosario Hernandez. Uh, uh, good afternoon, my name is Rosario Hernandez. Y también diga el punto en el que va a hablar, Del punto ocho. I'm speaking on uh, item number eight. Okay, you have one minute. Tiene un minuto. Uh, estoy aquí por, uh, para que nos ayuden con, con el dueño que no nos quiere perdonar la deuda y él sí le van a perdonar todo sus cinco millones. I'm here to ask for help so that you can help um, us to have our debt forgiven because the owner uh, is not forgiving it, and, but yet his debt is being forgiven with uh, millions. Tengo mucho estrés porque hacemos uh, familias de bajos recursos. I'm a, um, no I tenemos, have a lot of stress because we're a low income family. No tenemos para pagar toda esa aumenta que esa renta que él nos está aumentando. Uh, we don't have it to be able to pay tenemos, all that rent that he's uh, increasing. Presión. We have a lot of pressure. Y queremos que todos los concejales nos ayuden. Por favor, we, need, we need all the council members to help us, please. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. And we've called Keisha Jones, Rabbi Dusty Brown, Fede Ramirez, Andy C. Go ahead, your name and the item. Okay, buenas tardes. Uh, Mi nombre es Federico. My name is Federico. Uh, soy inclino de Hill, Sevilla. Okay. I, I'm a renter. Y, in y Hills. Estamos en el artículo 8. Uh, okay, great. I'm yeah. speaking on point number yeah. eight. Okay. I want to say que todos los inquilinos de Gil, Sevilla, all the renters of Gil, Sevilla, contra ustedes, ¿qué tiene contra ellos? Contra todos ustedes, porque no se me hace justo. I have something against all of you because it's, I don't think it's just. Siento que ustedes son un poco elitistas. I think a, that some a, of you guys are elitists. A darle un poder to give a un señor power que es millonario. to a man who is a, a millionaire. Los inquilinos. And all of us renters. Okay. Okay. Eh, disculpen el, la palabra elitista, pero realmente sí lo siento y siento que todos los inquilinos de Gil Sevilla estamos en el mismo punto. Excuse the word elitist, but I do feel that all of the renters in Quil Sevilla are, are on the same point in agreement. Se me hace un poco ridículo que si estamos aquí nosotros por demanda de, de la renta tan, tan alta. I think it's ridiculous that if we're all here for a demand of the rent being so high. De la necesidad que tenemos de que no podemos pagar el adeudo. The, of the need that we have, that we can't pay the rent Y les and vuelvo, the debt. A re, vuelvo a reiterar lo que dijo hace ratito mi compañera, mi vecina. I'm going to reiterate um, what my neighbor over here said a little bit ago. Que se me hace tan triste que un señor con tantos millones, ustedes le den la oportunidad que pague cinco millones en diez años y that sin it, ningún interés. That is so sad that you could give a man who is so rich um, five million dollars and without any interest. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Gracias por su comentario. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Your name and the items you're speaking on. Hi, my name is Andy and I'm speaking on item eight. Okay, you have one minute. Hillside Villa has been fighting against an illegal triple rent increase for the past five years. 
We have tenants here today and at home who are elders on fixed social security income. We can't afford to pay Tombots more money then, and certainly not now with the rising cost of living. Sharon Chung couldn't be here with us today because she is disabled and can barely afford the affordable rent today on SSI. She owes back rent and monthly payments on this would amount to $500 per month. Tom Bonds does not need her money now and he's never needed her money then in the past years of the pandemic. The city needs to do better by Hillside Villa. You are already giving him over $15 million and forgiving his debts to the city. The bare minimum would be to amend the deal to drop all pending evictions and forgive tenants rent debt. Thank you. Sorry, one second. Speaker, speaker, before you go, can you just state your name one more time? Andy. Annie or Andy? Andy. Andy, perfect. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, Keisha Jones, Rabbi Dusty Brown, Frank Kretzman, Ed Concepcion, Ellen Evans, Juan Munoz. No, I don't think you're Rabbi Dusty Brown. It's the name of my favorite Sorry. dog. Can I have the next speaker, please? You, sir, you are not called. Anybody else here, Rabbi Dusty Brown? No. What? Well, anybody else here, Rabbi Dusty Brown? If you, if you are not Rabbi Dusty Brown, you were not called to speak, sir. What? Thank you. Am I Rabbi Dusty You're, Brown? Everyone else I, is waiting to speak. Am I Rabbi Dusty Brown? Anybody else here Rabbi Dusty Brown? Yeah. Is that the name you signed you're up not, under? You're not the, that's it's not the name you signed up under? I'm sorry, sir. Why not? I'm taking a slot. You no. call Rabbi I'm Dusty sorry, Brown? I'm sorry. You were not called, sir. Next speaker, please. Next speaker. Come on, there's so many people waiting to speak, sir. sir. I'm so sorry. Sir, you're starting to I'm really sorry, the... sir. We're going to have to get speakers who signed up. Next speaker, please make your way to the podium. Next speaker, please. Your name and the items you wish to speak on. Uh, Frank Krenzman and Great. Uh, item number two. Okay. And you have just a general comment. Is Besides. You have one minute for the item, one minute for general public comment. Go ahead. Thank you. I noticed that my council, oh, is that, no, I guess no. Um, I'm an Airbnb unit holder, owner, okay. and. Sir, can I, I ask you to bring your microphone up closer? Oh, is this better? Oh, I'm sorry. Not that close, but yeah, a little closer. Okay. That's good. I have an Airbnb in Venice, California, and have had it for about two years, two and a half years. Okay. In that time, it's been on the market for 27 months, 28 months, and I've generated more than $1,000 a month in tax revenue directly to the city. I've also paid a number of people to take care of my unit, housekeepers, uh, handymen, that kind of thing. I pay them all 50 or $60 an hour. And this is the only way that I can stay in my home by renting it out on the Airbnb platform. So if the council decides not to have the extended use permit capability, I will be forced to sell my home. I want you all to at least keep that in mind when you're making changes to the Airbnb process or the home sharing process. I also want to make sure that you understand that in the 27 or so months that I've had my permit, I've spent 16 months attempting to get the permit. 16 months it's taken me to get my permit in place and they keep on denying my permit even though I follow all of their rules. So just changing my name as if I got married or something like that, there is no process for that. You have to start over from scratch, which is ridiculous because that is a bureaucratic hurdle that most people can't get over. Keep that in mind, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker, your name and the items you're speaking on. Hi, my name is Ed Concepcion. I'm speaking on item number eight in okay. regards to uh, Hillside Via. You have one minute, sir. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, 
My name's Ed. I am a tenant at Hillside Via, and we were just recently given a deal that was developed by LAHD and our landlord, Tom Botts. And unfortunately, there was no transparency, so we didn't know what was what were the details of the deal until a few days ago. Part of that deal includes he will be given $15 million, and we weren't even given any money to help support our back rent, which occupied maybe is around maybe 1.5. So it's difficult for all of us that are asking for support when we're gonna pay more rent with the 3% than we did before COVID, before the whole issue happened, because my rent went up $1,000. So unfortunately, my salary didn't go up $1,000 per month. So we're having to pay more than, than what we're asking for. So I'm just, we're just hoping that city council will help out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. And I'll call a few other names. Virginia Sanchez, Pamela Ford, Maria Mora, and Dino Baglioni. Go ahead. Your My name and Ellen items Evans. you're speaking on. My name's Ellen Evans and I'm speaking on item two on behalf of Bever Bel Air Beverly Crest Neighborhood Council. Uh, is it a neighborhood council comment? Is it a community impact statement? There's been met multiple community impact statements submitted to the file. Um, so does that mean city attorney, Ms. Chang? Sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, you're going to you're going to make a public. I'm not sure I quite understood the what, sometimes what? neighborhood councils, if they're making a community impact statement, are given extra time. You're free to accommodate the extra time if, that, if that's what you Can wish. I give you three minutes? Is that that's enough? That's perfect. Okay, go thank ahead. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, thank you so much to Council Member Raman and her staff and to planning for their diligent work on this issue. We appreciate and support the many recommendations that have been made. The following comments apply specifically to whole unit short-term rentals, not to true home sharing, that is, people renting out parts of their homes. The impact of short-term rentals on housing markets is clear, and this is why municipality after municipality has tightened the regulations. Our ordinance was designed to minimize this impact through the primary residence requirement, but due to enforcement challenges, this hasn't worked. Restoring housing to the long-term market is the number one reason effective enforcement is necessary. There are over 22,000 listings for short-term rentals in Los Angeles, and most of those are for whole units. Enforcement was a known problem from the start. In fact, Council Member David Roos sent a letter to planning regarding the very first draft of this ordinance, and in it he said, there's one issue that I want to highlight and be clear as a major red flag for me, the lack of a clear funding stream and plan for enforcement. Without a real plan for enforcement, our residents will accurately feel that they were subject to a bait and switch. This cannot happen. But this is exactly what has happened. In 2019, Bob Duenas, who was then overseeing the home sharing program, attended a meeting of our neighborhood council to answer questions. When asked what would happen when people falsely claimed a location as their primary residence, Mr. Duenas responded that planning would not do any investigations and that a permit would be issued whenever the required documents were presented. And so our area is rife with short-term rentals with permits registered by, by people who don't actually live in the homes, and this has been the case for years. Permit seekers do what is necessary to obtain their documents and there's no recourse. The number of permits that have been revoked on the basis that they were obtained fraudulently is zero. The primary residence requirement was supposed to ensure that hosts were community members who would uphold community standards. It turns out that when they are not, they do not. The good news is that there are people who know exactly who lives in a dwelling. There's the county assessor's office, which knows whether owners are claiming that a property is their primary residence, and there are neighbors who really do know who lives next door. Um, we look forward to a time when there's a mechanism for neighbors to be a source of data. It's well past time to ensure that all permit holders are truly living where they claim to live. Overall enforcement must be more robust. The city has been reluctant to issue fines with only eight issued in our neighborhood council territory in 2023 and one in 2024. And this is not because overall compliance is near perfect. If fines are to have a de deterrent effect, they must be levied with consistency and assessed at a level that would act as a deterrent to future violations, but which is not catastrophic for home sharers who may have made a simple mistake. The McGill study concluded that half or more short-term rental listings are non-compliant. That's thousands of units that can't be owned by people who actually want to live there. 
Our ordinance has been in effect for a number of years. Dealing with enforcement challenges must not be put off any longer. I urge you to take decisive and swift action to correct the program and to end the bait and switch the citizens of Los Angeles were served. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, your name and the items you wish to speak on. Um, Juan Munoz Guevara, item two. Okay. Honorable Chair Rahman and members, my name is Juan Munoz Guevara, political coordinator with Unite Here Local 11. I am here today to urge this committee to not only move forward with the recommendations made by city planning, but also to emphasize the importance of establishing a private right of action and mandatory API agreement put forth in the Blumenfeld motion. Illegal short-term rentals take housing units off the long-term market, increasing the cost of rent for people like our members. In a 2022 report, it is estimated that STRs raise rents for the average renter by as much as $810 per year in the city of LA since 2015, taking hard-earned dollars out of our members' hands. Many of our members are long-term residents being pushed out by high rents and lack of housing, forcing them to move out of the city and commute long hours to get to work. Um, please give residents the power to safeguard housing against illegal STRs by creating a private right of action and giving the city more accurate tools to support enforcement through mandatory API agreements. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, your name and the items you're speaking on. Uh, my name is Dino Baglioni. I'm speaking on item number two. I am a uh, lifelong resident of this city. Sorry, you have, you have one minute. Property and owner. Sorry, your name is Dino. Dino? Baglioni. Okay, great. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of this city, I'm a property owner, I've lived in the same area for almost 45 years, and uh, very much invested in the Airbnb program. Uh, I count upon that income uh, very much for my survival. Um, I do believe that from what my experience with Airbnb and the city it has been that the city uh, uh, enforcement procedures and the basic structure that they use to manage the short-term rentals is where the work really needs to take place. Um, not by reducing the ability of property owners and taking away the ability to raise income and taxes uh, for the city, uh, this does not solve the problem. What solves the problem is an organization with the city that works, where the city planning is not stuck doing everything and where we don't have to wait months and months for a return phone call. That's frustrating and it takes away from the job that's really at hand. There are many property owners like myself who own the property, who rent out rooms in our property, for, and we rely on that income. And we don't want that to be taken away from us because the program, the administrative end, can't keep up with it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Next speaker, your name and the items you're speaking on. I'll call a few more names. We're still waiting on Virginia Sanchez, Pamela Ford, Maria Mara, I'll also call Alejandro G, Janie Kohler, Lisa Lewis, and Maria Kiz Kizirian. Go ahead, speaker. Your name and the items you're speaking on. Okay. Buenas tardes. Honorable Presidenta Ramón. Un segundo, señora. Gracias. Continúe, por favor. Buenas tardes. Honorable Presidenta Ramón y miembros. Mi nombre es María Mora y he trabajado en Hotel Índigo como recamarera durante siete años. Okay, un segundo. Uh, hi, honorable members of the council. I have uh, worked as a housekeeper in the Indigo Hotel for over seven years. Soy residente del Distrito 9 y miembro de United Here Local 9. Muchas familias. Perdón, ¿puede repetirse? ¿Puede repetirse, señora? Okay. Soy... Soy residente del distrito local, soy de residente del distrito 9 y miembro del United Hill Local 11. I am a, I live in District 9 and I'm a member of uh, United Local 11. Muchas familias se han visto afectadas por viviendas a corto plazo, ya se han ido. A lot of families have seen themselves affected by short-term rentals and they've had to leave. Familias y niños arrancados de las comunidades que aún que aman debido al mercado ilegal de viviendas. Uh, families and children who have been torn away from their living spaces that they love because of the illegal housing market. Que continúan operando en la ciudad. That continue to operate in the city. Los residentes de Los Ángeles necesitan la tranquilidad de saber que tenemos 
un, uno de recur, recursos más en caso de que la ciudad siga batallando en reforzar la ley. Uh, the people of Los Angeles uh, need more safety in knowing that we have resources necessary in case the city uh, keeps having these issues in terms of fighting for these laws. Por eso insto al Consejo a modificar la HSO para salvaguardar, salvaguardar nuestra vivienda y crear un derecho de acción privado lo antes posible. Gracias. That's why I'm asking the city uh, to make these changes for the HSO and so that that way you guys can help safeguard our living spaces. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker, your name and the items you're speaking on. My name is Virginia Sanchez. I'm speaking on item two. Item two, you have one minute. Honorable Chair Raman and members of the committee, my name is, Vir oh. I have worked at the Inter Intercontinental as a room attendant for seven years. The home sharing ordinance was passed in 2018 to protect workers like me from displacements due to short-term rentals. But here we are years later, later, still under threat. According to a 2022 report, short-term re rental has led to increased rent by hundreds of dollars a year. We need communities with stability and more places for families. We need homes to live. Our families need stable homes and neighborhoods to thrive, free from threat of displacement. I urge the council to amend the HSO to safeguard housing and create a private right of action. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. I'll call three more names. Sunik. Naleli Gomez, Nayeli Gomez, and Joseph Soto. Go ahead, your name and the items you're speaking on. Hello, my name is Pamela Ford. I'm speaking on item two. Okay, my you, husband and I. You have one minute. Go ahead. My husband and I and two kids have lived in North Hollywood in our home for 20 years. In 2016, we took our dilapidated garage at the back of our driveway and converted it, built it up from nothing, and built it into a guest house. We got our permit, we got our license, and we started operating. And before you know it, uh, LADBS came knocking at our door and decided that we needed, they needed to have a look because it was built without permits. At that point, they pulled our permit for uh, having our Airbnb uh, legally. And I would just like to let you know that my husband and I are both self-employed. We don't have a 401k, we don't have a pension like you all do. And this was to support us in our retirement years and this was also to send our kids to college. We don't have a college fund without our Airbnb that we built. We did not take housing stock. We built this property. And I would just like to add our income Thank has you. been reduced by one third. We are now at the low income level here in Los Angeles. Thank you. Next speaker, please. My Your name, name and the items you're speaking on. Alejandro Gutierrez, I'm speaking on item number two and public comment. Okay, you have uh, one minute for the item, one minute for public comment. Yeah, I live in Jose Villa for 27 years. When we moved in there, I never expected that after all those years, I was gonna be, um, experiencing a threat of being displaced because of this covenant expired and we didn't know about it. Now there is a deal that uh, put us in a bad situation where the landlord is getting uh, or is offered to get $15 million plus $5 million that he owes for 30 years and extend the debt for 10 more years. And in our case, the, the deal says that we have to pay our um, debt rent with a 3% in, um, included, and that is like a trend increase for us, and that's what we've been fighting for almost six years, that we cannot afford to pay us these trend increases. So we are um, here as a community of Hills Villa in Chinatown to ask you to improve this deal. And regards of um, the deal, just want to make uh, this um, emphasize that the deal was between Tom Butts and the housing department. 
the director on Sul, and we were not included in any of those negotiations. We, didn't, we were not um, asked what we wanted, what it was good for us. So how housing department knew what it was good for us. So two years ago, she, uh, the housing department was instructed by the council, uh, for the city council, to make a plan to acquire the Hillside Villa to make an appraisal, a, a appraisal, and it took two years to be done. But meanwhile, she was focusing on this shitty deal that is not benefit us. So please make something to improve this deal and we cannot be displaced from our long-term housing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> next speaker, next speaker, your name and the items you're speaking on. My name is Lisa Lewis from uh, District 1. I'd like to speak on um, number two, short-term rentals, but I also have some general public okay. so you have comments. One minute for the item, one for. minute for general public comment. Go ahead. Picture a happy home in Neela called the Cozy, the Cozy Mount Washington Bungalow. Notice its large tended garden, clean and comfortable interiors, a place where travelers and neighbors alike are welcomed. My short-term rental home, ever compliant and well-managed since day one of the founding ordinance, has become a magnet for community. There are no neighbor complaints. In fact, three of my next door neighbors revel in placing parents and in-laws at the cozy. They are young millennial families with pandemic children and no space for visiting grandparents. Travelers are briefed on new eateries and shops coming back to Highland Park. They are given tap cards to use the Metro. A two block walk away, they are told it is possible to, heaven forbid, not rent a car in LA. I tell them about the flyaway bus and how to arrive without a rental car. But you scream, what about affordable housing? Yes, it's mine. 24 years of sweat and tears on Marmion Way. It's, do I just roll into the, it's now the site of that proverbial fixed income social security reliant senior citizen. Council members instituting a 120 day limit on short term rentals won't be enough for me to continue. The caring and sharing on my corner will necessarily cease. Tampering with extended registration punishes hosts like me who have made it this far totally compliant and at a time according to your report when compliance and enforcement are finally getting sorted out. Now I do want to in my general statement say that I have had great difficulty working with the city's uh, home sharing office that in five years every single year for unknown reasons to me I have been denied and had to fight to get my renewal for my um, either extended or regular. Um, is it, was that two minutes? That was two minutes. Thank Can you. Can I have two minutes more? <laughs> I'm sorry, we have so many other speakers. Well, I appreciate your comment and we are working on making okay, the system just, better. Thank let you Let me so just much. say, I did put on file my uh, writing. I urge people to look at it Thank you. and to read the rest of it for themselves. Thank and to know speaker. that I am at the service of you with my own host report Thank to you. tell you why maybe hosts are not being compliant. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, your name and the items you're speaking on. My name is Nayeli Gomez. Honorable Chairman sorry, Rahman. You, sorry, one second. Your name one more time. Nayeli Gomez. Okay, thank you. Honorable Chairman Rahman and members of the committee, my name is Nayeli Gomez and I have worked at the courtyard in downtown Los Angeles as a food attendant for 10 years. I am a resident of Los Angeles and a member of Unite Here Local 11. Amid a housing crisis, we need to preserve every single unit of the housing that already exists in our neighborhoods. For long-term tenants, many of my coworkers have been priced out of our city. Every single illegal listing means a long-term resident is unable to live in the city where they work, where they raise their families, and where they take their kids to school. I urge the council to safeguard housing against illegal STRs by creating a private right of action where we can act against illegal operators. Thank you and I yield the rest of my time. Next speaker please, your name and the items you're speaking on. Uh, my name is Sonic, speaking on item eight. 
Okay, you have one minute. Okay, Quiet. so the proposed deal was negotiated without tenants at the table and must be amended. The deal should include money to cover all of the tenants' rent debt, which would be under $2 million. Considering that the millionaire landlord bots is getting $20 million through this deal, the fact that there's nothing in the deal to address the rent debt of dozens of working class families who have been fighting for their right to stay housed for six years now is an absolute travesty. The city is pulling from a $100 million fund of linkage fees to pay the $15 million to bots. These fees are continuously replenished and are unrelated to the current city deficit. Why can't an extra $2 million in linkage fees be added to the deal to cover the rent debt or subtracted from bots' $15 million? The city claims that it's because linkage fees cannot be used to pay for rent debt, that it's strictly to build and preserve affordable housing. But what is preserving affordable housing other than keeping working class people housed and protecting them from eviction? The concept of the linkage fee applies directly to the tenant's rent debt. Working people across LA have eyes on this struggle. Do the right thing and amend the deal. Thank you. Next, next speaker. Hi, my issue is number two. My name is Maria Kazirian. Um, so um, first, I've been a landlord since 2008, and I have a building with four units solely for previously homeless people. I work with HACLA and LACTA and consider this doing my part to help with the housing problem. But I'm just one person. person. I read the recent report and find that the vast majority of the concerns are actually legitimate when it comes to uh, short-term rentals especially when it comes to RSO units and low-income housing apartments. I don't believe these should be allowed to be Airbnbs. But I'm talking about those of us who rent out our own homes for additional income and rely on it. My main concern is the elimination of extended home sharing and the lack of staffing at the department. I was approved for an extension in December but never got the link to pay. Two weeks ago I got an email saying essentially that the link was sent and let me know if you want to continue hosting. I also had surgery recently and haven't been able to work, so, I'm not, so I will lose my house if I can't afford um, to pay my mortgage, and Great can thing. I just finish that thought? Thank you. Finish the thought. And so essentially I'd be just contributing to this issue myself, and I think a lot of us would as well. Great. Thank you very much. Next speaker. That's, it. Uh, that's the last of the speakers here. I don't think we have any phone call speakers, right? Oh, there are more names to the list? Stand, hold up one second. Um, okay. Lisa Schweitzer, there are, there are additional names. I didn't have the list in front of me. Uh, Kip Putnam, Joseph Soto, Janie Kohler, Maria uh, Kazirian, Sunke Kim. Is there any... Come on up. Sorry. Agenda item two, Lisa Schweitzer. Thank you for the opportunity to share experiences with home sharing in the Hollywood Hills. Of course, I'm supportive of construction measures to ease the housing crisis and homelessness in our communities. Our issues are specific to whole home rentals. For several years, we have had to live through outrageous parties, commercial corporate events, influencer events, and now TikTok creators taking over our neighborhoods. Our right to quiet enjoyment no longer seems to matter. We believe many of these homes are rented out by vacation rental companies who operate on behalf of the owners. Most of the owners either live out of the country or claim the property to be their primary residence. How can these homes possibly obtain a legal permit? To that point, we also have a home on our street that is a newly constructed building that was given home that was given a permit before they received their certificate, certificate of occupancy. We also have a home on our street that rents beds by the hour. These are all examples of how the rental community is taking advantage of the lack of oversight and enforcement in the city of Los Angeles. Please, we need better enforcement. Thank you. Your name and the items you're speaking on? Hi, my name is Maria, and I'm here to speak in behalf of the neighbors of those owners of home sharing. Okay, uh, and I live so it's a hail. item two, I, so you have one minute. Go okay. ahead. Uh, I live a hail being a neighbor of one of these owners. Uh, I was threatened by the owner. I was threatened by many people on, the, on my street that she invited to her house to come to her swimming pool 
and have all day online parties, right? So I couldn't sleep. I, I, I got really frustrated until this day I have uh, neighbors that they, call, that they look at me passing by and they say, bitch, you are a bitch. Why? Because you guys let these people do whatever they want. And when I call the officers that are here, my respects to them, they didn't, know how, didn't even know how to deal with it. And they helped me. The one that was with in, my, in my area, he helped me. So please, please, don't make a living hell to the neighbors of these people. I don't care if they want to get rich, if they need income, whatever. I don't care. But we need to be respected as neighbors of Thank these people. You. Thank you very much, Speaker. Next speaker. Uh, we have Lisa Schweitzer, Kip Putnam, Joseph Soto, Janie Kohler. That was Maria who just spoke, right? Uh, and we can call a couple of other names. We'll call Trish, Jacob, um, Nancy, and uh, Vero, V-E-R-O. Go ahead, your name and the items you're speaking on. My name is Kip Putnam. I'm speaking about number two. Okay, you have one minute. Thanks. I'm a property owner in Los Angeles. I'm here to express my opinion that we need stricter rules regarding the short-term rentals. We need stiffer penalties for violations and we need much better enforcement. I live on a street that is only a tenth of a mile long with three illegal short-term rental homes, party houses. To be clear, I'm not talking about the actual home sharing owners who have spoken here. I appreciate their concerns and I'm sorry that they have been lumped in with these illegal whole house rentals. The houses I'm speaking against are party houses. They aren't shared primary residences. They are 365 day a year businesses operated by absentee owners and investor groups in quiet residential neighborhoods like ours. We've endured countless parties of 200 plus people with DJs and bands on the front lawns blasting music till four or five in the morning, multiple days a week. The party guests and cars routinely block the roads. On more than one occasion, we've had ambulances and fire trucks unable to get through because of the party congestion. It's just a matter of time before something more tragic happens. The neighbors feel powerless. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker, your name and the items you're speaking on. Hi, I'm speaking on number two, as well as a little bit of general comment. Okay. You have one minute for the item, one minute for general public okay. comment. I'm speaking oh, on sorry. behalf and, of Sorry, one minute. What is your name one more time? Trish. Okay. Trish, thank you okay. very much. I'm speaking on behalf of single family homeowners who cannot afford to stay in their homes without short term rental revenue. In this environment of record inflation, many of us, especially those of us who are partially disabled, seniors who do not have a 401k, cannot afford to not short term rent. The city's extremely pro-tenant laws make it impossible to safely take a long-term renter. Due to inabil inability to timely evict, taking the wrong long-term renter may put some of us on the street and exacerbate the homelessness crisis. The burden of, of providing affordable long-term rentals in this city's environment should fall on large developers and corporate landlords, not on mom and pop landlords who live at their subject property. As per the original as per the original intent of Airbnb, which is home sharing, perhaps short-term renting should be limited to homes where an owner or tenant lives in part of the home. Please do not limit the number of days that owners who live in part of the property can rent their home. It is by far my greatest source of income. If not for being able to rent short-term all year, I and many others would not be able to, to pay the mortgage, health care, and other living expenses. Focus needs to be on enforcement and getting rid of illegal short-term units, not limiting the number of days for legal short-term landlords. Next speaker, your name and the items you're speaking on. My name is Jacob, number eight in public comment. General okay, public you have comment. one minute for your item, one minute for general public comment. I'm here to speak in support of the Hillside Villa tenants. The whole point of this deal is to stop evictions. Giving Tom Botts $15 million in cash is to stop evictions. But this deal as currently written does not do that. This deal as currently written leaves people with rent debt that they will be unable to pay and therefore immediately vulnerable 
to eviction. I'm here as an organizer, but also as a lawyer. I am representing 11 tenants who are under eviction right now in court. I am coordinating the 35 eviction cases that we are fighting in court right now. This deal doesn't even require Tom Botts to drop the current evictions. The fact that that was not put in in writing by the housing department is so shameful, I don't even have words to describe it. Ann Sewell isn't here right now. Good. She should be embarrassed to show her face. This deal provides $15 million in cash and doesn't even require the landlord to drop. Oh, you are here, Ann Sewell. I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. Shame on you. Shame Attend on you. Sorry, attendees. Please be quiet. Please be quiet. You have public comments. I still have 30 Speakers, seconds left, if you're Mr. not Pop. quiet, we can't have you in here. Yeah, and please please tell speak the deputy, to everyone with respect. Thank please you. Tell the deputy, I still have 30 seconds left. You still have 30 seconds. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. The main point is this back rent needs to be dealt with. Uh, Councilmember Hernandez's amendment buying six months of time is a start. That's the bare minimum. Otherwise, under this deal, Tom Botts can wake up May 1st and serve new eviction notices for 12 months of back rent. That is terrible. That is terrible. This deal does not protect people from evictions and needs to be made better. Thank you. Next speaker, your name and the items you're speaking on. Hola, mi nombre es Nancy y estoy, uh, quiero hablar de la número ocho. Nan Nancy? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi, you my have name one is, minute. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Nancy and I want to talk about number eight. Tiene eh, dos minutos? One minute. One Un minuto. A mi nombre es Verónica. Tenemos seis años luchando por una renta justa contra un aumento de renta del 100%. My name is Veronica, and we have been fighting for six years because of a rent increase of 100%. Y ahora es estresante pagar el adeudo con un 3% extra. And now we have to stress, about, stress out about paying the debt with a 3% extra. Mientras el dueño va a recibir 15 millones y una... una En una extensión para pagar una deuda que él tiene con la ciudad por seis años. Whilst the owner gets 15 million and also gets a six year extension to pay a debt that he has with the city. Deben de trabajar hacia la, a la, a la necesidad, no hacer más rico a una persona. You should be working for the necessities of people and not to make someone richer. Como concejales siempre en, en plataformas públicas Dicen que tienen planes para ayudar a la gente a una vivienda económica y accesible, ¿no? As uh, the city council you and public figures, you guys say that you are here to help us uh, live in a way that's dignified and to have the resources that we need. Pues volteen hacia allá, aquí está la necesidad. ¿Qué van a hacer con nosotros que les estamos pidiendo ayuda para tener una vivienda accesible? y dejar de ayudar a aquella gente que la verdad no tiene necesidad y dar tanto dinero hacia ese dueño. Look over here, look at these people who need it. What are you going to do to help these people instead of helping a man who doesn't need the help we do? Por favor, queremos un trato justo donde seamos tomados nuestros derechos y de, nos den nuestra ayuda, por favor. Please, we Thank want you. a fair deal where you're taking in consideration our rights. Oh, no more? Okay, um, we have about five more minutes for speakers, uh, so I'll call a few more names. I've called names that haven't come up, but we'll continue to call names. Veronica Hernandez, Alexis W., Kathy Moten, Kathy Hirsch, Mary Ramos, and Nina Menquez. If you hear your name, go to the side. I didn't realize there weren't more speakers. I apologize for that. Come. Okay, go up to the front. State your name and the items you're speaking on. Okay. Your name? Kathy Mouton. Kathy Mouton, okay. And your, uh, the items you're speaking on? Number two. Okay, you have one minute, go ahead. Thank you. 
I live in a rent-controlled building that was built in... Uh, Sorry, I'm going to ask... One minute. I'm going to ask everyone in the chambers to please be quiet and be respectful of our speakers. Shh. I can't hear her. And Kathy, if you could just come closer to the microphone, that will be helpful. Sorry. Thank you. My name is Kathy Mouton. I leave, live in a 1920s built uh, cottage complex, a gated community, that in 2018, one of the tenants and not the owner began to Airbnb it. Mm. The, a second one was added in nine, uh, 2019, a third in 2020, a fourth in 2021, on the part of the landlord who decided that he was missing out on the action. Uh, it's it, what was leased as a long-term cottage became a revolving door. Sometimes there were as many as 12 to 14 groups in one week, all knowing the gate code, uh, uh, regardless of, of time or, or, or days or anything like that. Uh, uh, Better Housing actually contacted me and the, the uh, facetious property owner was fined $5,000 and he requested a, re a review. This is over a year ago and nothing has been done. Okay. Thank you, Speaker, for your testimony. We appreciate it. Next speaker, your name and the items you're speaking on. My name is Kathy Hirsch, and I'm speaking on item two. Okay, you have one minute. I live in um, Eagle Rock with my husband. We've lived in our home for 40 years. Uh, we renovated a space in our home in 2018 to become Airbnb hosts. As seniors, we depend on that income to make ends meet. We are not taking away affordable housing from anyone. We live on site and our guests are respectful of our neighbors. Uh, stop punishing those of us hosts who play by the rules. The planning department's idea to modify... <laughs> the planning department's idea to modify eligibility criteria and limit bookings to simplify program administration, and that's a quote from their report, is a cop-out. Do your job. Thank you. Next speaker, your name and the items you're speaking on. Um, hi, my name is Nina Menkes, speaking on item two. Item two, you um, have one minute. I just want to uh, kind of reiterate what other folks have said about being a host who is compliant and quiet and law-abiding and should not be punished for the, the people who are non-compliant. And planning, indeed, has to do the job and not blame us for it. I also just want to correct a couple of things that we've heard today that <clears throat> someone mentioned there's 22,000 Airbnb units in LA. That's not correct. There's 9,500, and it's less than half of 1% of rental units. Affordable housing issues have nothing to do with the small amount of Airbnbs that people like myself and many others are using to survive. <laughs> Um, so I think you know that we're living in a brutal financial environment and we absolutely need the ability to host uh, with the extended permit. <clears throat> um, I also want to bring up the current police permit requirement is an unnecessary hurdle for residents who share our home and a poor use of LAPD resources. LAPD doesn't want to do it. Nobody wants to do it. Get rid of it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We have, I believe, just two more speakers. Go ahead. Your name and the items you're speaking on. Thank you. Go ahead. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Mary Ramos. I live in Hillside Villa for 15 years. Okay, so you have one minute for your item. Go ahead. Thank you. I just want to know, I just want to tell you, Tom Bugs owes money from the city and he never pay any percent to give back. And he never pay his, he owns the city, nothing. And us, we are being evicted and being raised for our rent for 100 to 300%. And he wants uh, an interest in it. Why do, a rich person will get more benefits from the city than us. What, what, I know that you can do something about this. So please, I want you to, to, to put in your mind 
that we are here. Eventually, we will be one of the homeless outside. So, please take, you, take care of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Mi nombre es Veronica. My name is Veronica. Y quiero hablar de la proposición ocho. And I want to talk about uh, point eight. Soy de Gil Sevilla y tengo 25 años viviendo ahí y solo vengo a, a proponerles que sean justos con el convenio que están haciendo con el dueño porque para nosotros no nos conviene, solo en lo que están pidiendo ya le dieron 15 millones por quedarnos a este, una extensión para tener unas rentas bajas. I, I just want to ask you guys to give us some help. Uh, you've already given Tom Botts an, an extension, uh, and we're struggling with rent. Y nosotros que somos personas trabajadoras y humildes, tenemos que pagar el 3%. Yo pienso que no es justo. Tienen que poner una balanza, no solo ponerse al lado del dueño. Okay. And, and those of us one who are hardworking people. Just one, one second. Can we just put an extra 30 seconds on her time? Sorry. If you can just pause so that she can translate, that would be helpful. Thank you. Si puede pausar un poquito para que podamos traducir. Continúe. Y por eso venimos a pedirles a ustedes que por favor nos tomen en cuenta que no somos... Somos personas que tenemos sentimientos y estamos teniendo muchos problemas. Somos personas enfermas. Yo tengo problemas del corazón. Um, I think it's unfair that those of us who are working class people, humble people, have to pay up to the 3%. I also would like you guys to uh, take note of the problems that we are facing. Some of us are sick. I'm a sick uh, person. I have uh, heart problems. Continue. Y solo es lo que les pido, que por favor hablan lo correcto, que sean justos, con, no nomás con el dueño, también con nosotros. Es todo. Gracias. That's why I'm asking you guys to be fair, to do what's just, not only for the owner, but also for us. Any other speakers who are waiting? Well, we, we called a number of speakers. We've taken public comment for an hour, which is what I had said initially. We, we, we don't have time for everybody to give public comment. I've tried to pick an assortment of speakers from all of the different issues. We've spoken for a full hour. If anyone's name has been called and they haven't spoken yet, you are welcome to speak. Your name was called? Okay. Well, and for, well, for all of these, the, at least for um, the home sharing issue, we'll have more chances to provide public comment in the future. And so we've heard from owners, so we will hear back. Okay. At this time, we're going to close public comment. Okay. If you have specific... Shh. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Shh. We've provided an hour for public comment. No, we provided a full hour for public comment. If you keep yelling, you will be asked to leave the chambers. Um, and we fulfilled our public comment requirements. Yes, um, I'm sorry, just to be clear, um, sorry, just to be clear, we are allowed to adopt reasonable, the legislature is allowed to adopt reasonable regulations, including a, a total time for public comment. Um, I do think that the time allotted meets that standard. Um, I understand that you're upset, but you can, you can go to the next council meeting and, and sign up for public comment um, at that time. And, and you'll all have the opportunity to provide written comment. Our staff is also here available to take comment. My office is also available for comments via phone or via email. We read everything, we listen to everything, and so does every other council office around this body. So I want to encourage you to share your feedback if you haven't have been given the opportunity to do it today through public comment. There are multiple ways to, to provide that feedback. And on the home sharing issue, you'll have opportunities in future meetings as well to provide spoken public comment. So I want to thank you all for coming. And at this time, we're going to close public comment. And let's move on to item eight.
and for the oh, record. Sorry, before we start item eight, let's start with the consent items. I was going to recommend that we take items one and four through seven on consent, unless there's objections from committee members. You're fine. Okay. So uh, if you can uh, call the item, re, uh, call the roll on those items. Yes, Madam Chair. Councilmember Raman. Do you need to read those items or we're good? Oh, sure. Okay. Item one is a Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority reports relative to an update of, on the LA Grand Hotel demobilization plan. Item four is a city administrative officer report relative to the, to the homelessness emergency declaration, 2023-24 third quarterly report. Item five is a city administrative officer and Los Angeles Housing Department reports and resolutions relative to issuing supplemental tax exempt multifamily housing revenue bonds in an amount to up to $1,955,95 and executing related financing documents for the Marcella Garden Supportive Housing Project located in Council District 9. Item six is a Los Angeles Housing Department report relative to executing a disposition and development development agreement with DWC Campus LP for the development of supportive housing on city-owned property and adjacent parcel located at 501 East 5th Street in Council District 514. And item seven is a municipal facilities committee report relative to a license agreement between the city and Hope the Mission for a Department of Recreation and Parks control property located at 6099 Laurel Canyon Boulevard for the operation of a tiny home village interim housing site. Okay, great. Can you call the roll on those items? Yes, Madam Chair. Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Uh, Councilmember Harris Dawson absent. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Aye. For eyes, these items are approved. Okay, let's start with item eight. Item eight is the Los Angeles Department, Housing Department report relative to the acquisition analysis and execution of a new covenant agreement for the Hillside Villa Apartments located at 636 North Hill Place in Council District 1 and related matters. Um, and we have staff here from LHD who will present their report on this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ann Sewell, General Manager, Los Angeles Housing Department. Um, People who are here, if you are not able to be quiet, we will ask for you to leave. I understand that there's strong feelings, but we do have to hear the item. We do have to have discussion. I'm so sorry, but you will have to be quiet, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm joined by the CAO's office as well as Trisha Keen, our executive officer. Um, I want to give a little background on, on the council's earlier actions and our response that have brought us to this. Um, in, as you know, Hillside Villa was a project built in 1989 with funding from the Community Redevelopment Agency in the city of Los Angeles and affordability covenants that began expiring at the end of 2018. In May of 2022, the city council directed the housing department to work to um, conduct due diligence studies to determine whether it would be feasible to purchase and preserve the property as affordable housing within the department's affordable housing managed pipeline guidelines. The word eminent domain was never used in those instructions. In order to do that, we needed to have access for an appraisal and some other studies, and the owner refused to give access and made it clear that he was not interested in a voluntary sale. The property is zoned for 345 units in a high value area, and the owner envisions that someday, many years into the future, um, it might be feasible to redevelop it, even acknowledging that state law requires the replacement of the affordable units on a one-for-one -one basis. Although the owner was not interested in a voluntary sale, we pursued getting an appraisal, and after a lot of back and forth in court, we finally were able to do the appraisal and secured a value in the last week of uh, $48 million. Um, we were able, even before we had, we had an earlier appraisal of 44.875, and we were able to determine that unless we could do a voluntary sale, the answer to the question of would it be feasible to purchase and, and um, renovate and preserve this property as an affordable building within our financial guidelines would be no, if we were to pursue it as eminent domain. 
However, understanding that the purpose behind that question was could we preserve the affordability for at least some period of time and prevent tenants from being displaced, the department pursued with the owner a covenant extension. And, you know, hours and hours of negotiation brought us to the deal that is before you in the transmittal today. Um, overall, the department is proposing a covenant extension fee of 14, almost $15 million, $14,950,000, which averages slightly over our guidelines of 140000 But I want to be clear that, that the average somewhat um, masks what is really um, involved in this extension. There are 106 units that, we, that would be covered by this extension fee and they fall into three categories. 38 of them have expired rental restrictions that were previously covenanted as very low or low income units and that do not have Section 8 vouchers on them. The start date for these units in the covenant extension would be January 1, 2019 and the end would be February 28, 2034. These units have the greatest difference between the affordable rents which range from 740 to about 1500 per month and the market rents of about 21 to 32 per month. These are one, two, and three bedroom units. So the total cost of these extensions equals 14.7 of the 14.95, or about $387,000 per unit. 34 of the units have covenants under an agreement with the California Housing Finance Agency that expired last month, and they also have tenants who have Section 8 vouchers. The difference between the market rents and the Section 8 rents ranges from about $200 per month, um, actually from $6 to about $200 um, dollars per month. And so the total cost of the covenant extension is only $141,000 or $4,000 per unit. Finally, there are 33 units without covenants with Section 8 vouchers that would be covenanted from the effective date of this agreement to February 28th, and the total cost for those is about $3,000 per unit. So most of the amount that we're being, um, that we are recommending putting into this is addressed to the needs of the lowest income tenants who don't have Section 8, who are in the units that lost their covenants. And frankly, most of it, the, the, the formula for calculating this was basically the net present value from the date of this agreement to the you know, end date, um, based on the difference between the market rent and the covenanted rent. And most of the value is in the is in the look back, not in the going forward. Um, so we are basically paying for the rent increase of that whole period from January 1, 2019 until the effective date of this increase, which is one of the reasons why the cost is so high. Um, it should be noted that as vacancies occur in the units with Section 8 voucher holders, if the owner is not able to secure more voucher holders, the rent would still be limited to the covenant of affordable rent, not to the Section 8 rent payment standard or the market rent. So, um, and it also should be noted that although our negotiations were extensive and had some scientific basis to them, at the end of the day, as costs kept changing, and as interest rates changed and the market rents changed, there did come a pencils down moment where we agreed to 15 years and 14.95, although our final analysis indicated that the value of our covenants that we're buying it would be over $18 million. The other benefit to the owner in this agreement would be the extension of the Community Redevelopment Agency loan of $3.5 million with a conversion from a residual receipts interest calculation, which was always zero during the first 30 years, to a 1% interest rate as well as a 1.8 interest-free um, HDG loan, both of which will be extended for the term of the covenant extension to February 2034, and the HDG loan will be amended to a service payback loan forgivable in annual increments. This loan conversion was agreed to in part during negotiations related to the release of all claims between the owner and the city. In addition to the longer affordability term, the benefits to the city and the residents are that the city receives a first right of refusal for the city to purchase the property if the owner or the owner's heirs choose to sell or accept an offer to sell before February 28, 2037 as well as an extended six-year repayment term for low-income residents who owe back rent and a mutual release of claims. Um, in the last several days, because of the, the work of um, Councilwoman Hernandez, as you heard, um, in addition to the extended six-year repayment term 
the owner has agreed to um, uh, the councilwoman's at the councilwoman's suggestion to a six month free period where um, the loan repayment term would not begin, the interest accrual would not begin until six months after the effective date of the agreement. So in May 2022, the council directed us to do the studies. We did at least the appraisal, although we never were able to do the other studies. And we did come to the conclusion that doing eminent domain, which usually results in an acquisition price of about 1.5 times the appraised value, would have led to a total development cost of over 877,000 per unit. And even with leverage financing with low income housing tax credits and, um, and money from the state, the cost to the city would have been 484,000 a unit. So to put paid to that question, no, it is not feasible for the city to acquire this except through a voluntary sale. Therefore, although we don't recommend pursuing an acquisition project, we do recommend pursuing the extension covenant as an alternative with the covenant fee of 14.95 as described in the report. We are proposing to take this money out of the affordable housing linkage fee. These apartments are a mix of one, two, and three bedroom units for working families. They are not supportive housing for people experiencing homelessness. So they are appropriate for the linkage fee, which um, that's what the Nexus study that created that fee was based on. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Trish Keen because there's uh, both CAO had some uh, changes, extensive uh, better wording and reorganizing changes of our recommendations. And then we also want to read into the record the change related to the six um, month period. Thank you, Trisha Keene for the housing department. I have a number of wording changes to read, so I will go through those and then certainly we can answer any questions. Um, so replace and report, replace the report recommendations with the following language, section A. Authorize the general manager of the Los, An Los Angeles Housing Department, LAHD, the city attorney, or their designees to execute the following agreements in substantial conformance with the terms described herein for the Hillside Villa Apartments located at 636 North Hill Place. S uh, section 1. Authorize LAHD to enter into a new affordability covenant with the owner of the Hillside Villa Apartments in substantial conformance with the terms described herein and instruct the city attorney to draft the covenants and any necessary documents to effectuate such agreement in exchange for a payment not to exceed $14,950,000. The covenants are for 106 units for 15 years, two months through February 28, 2034, with the unit mix as outlined in the chart below, and there's a chart reference showing the breakdown of the 106 units. Section two, authorize LAHD to negotiate to enter into and the city attorney to prepare an amendment to the participation and loan agreement and a new agreement containing covenants affecting real property and any other necessary documents in connection thereto including A, retroactively reinstate and extend the term of HDG loan CRA 871015-003, that's $1.86 million housing development grant program loan with 636 NHP LLC from the original end date of March 1st, 2024 to a new end date of February 28th, 2034. Amend loan to a 0% interest forgivable service payback loan forgivable in annual increments. Section B, retroactively reinstate and extend the term of CRA loan, CRA 871015-004, uh, $3,585,300 CRA LA, CRA LA loan with 636 NHP LLC from the original end date of March 1st, 2024 to a new end date of February 28th, 2034. Amend loan to a 1% simple interest loan with a payment due annually and a balloon payment of principal at the end of the term. Add 2C, which reads term number eight in the LAHD report dated April 12th, 2024 shall be amended to read as extended repayment period for COVID related and back debt and add a sentence, additionally a sentence shall be added to the end of that term that states the repayment period and any payments required under a repayment agreement shall not commence until six months after the date of the, the effective date of this agreement. Section B, request the controller to obligate and expend affordable housing linkage fee funds to pay the covenant fee to the owner as follows. It's reflected in a chart referenced in the written document you will receive, totaling $14.95 million. 
Um, just a couple more provisions. Section C, authorize LEHD to draw demand warrant from the linkage fee fund 59T, payable to owner or its designee as directed in an amount not to exceed $14.95 million. Section D, authorize the general manager of LEHD or designee to disperse up to $14.95 million from the affordable housing linkage fee fund to be deposited into escrow with an escrow company mutually acceptable to city and owner. And finally, E, authorize LAHD, the city attorney, or their designees to make necessary technical adjustments, including additional, additional controller instructions to implement mayor and council intent regarding this matter, subject to the approval of the city administrative officer and request the controller to implement the instructions. Thank you. Thank you. We welcome your questions. Well, thank you so much for uh, making that presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, we've heard a lot from tenants around um, eviction, potential threat of evictions. Can you talk a little bit about whether there are provisions in the agreement that can help stave off any future evictions uh, in the site, given the contentious history that we've seen at this um, location? Yes, definitely. Um, so in the agreement, the, the owner has filed, I believe, roughly 40, maybe 40, a, a couple over 40 unlawful detainer notices that are for unpaid rent that include what would have been the original affordable rent that the tenants owed, as well as the the rent that this agreement will pay for. So when this agreement is signed and the payment is made, that part of the rent obligation goes away. And the agreement with the owner that is um, in the documents that are being negotiated you know, at this point is that as long as the tenants signed the new leases and the, and the rent repayment agreement that would not start for six months, then the unlawful detainer actions will be dropped, and that will be spelled out in the agreement. And I think the conversations with the um, council office and the owner have been, you know, there's a fair amount of distrust on all sides, and things like, you know, maybe we use escrow, we're gonna do an escrow account to put our documents and our money in, and his documents, maybe we even put the, the leases in there and the loan repayments, so everybody knows when this happens, it's all settled and everybody can go forward. And so that will be written into the agreement? That will be written into the agreement. Okay. Um, I have other questions, but I know other committee members also have questions, uh, so I want to open up the floor. And what Ms. happens in Mr. 2030? Lee, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Lee. What happens in 2034? In 2034, the, um, the uh, protections expire again. and. Those tenants who are on um, Section 8 would still have, you know, the ability to either pay whatever the market rent was or to, you know, take their Section 8 somewhere else. The 30, 38 tenants that are there now that don't have Section 8, um, if they are still there, they would, you know, be in the same position they were January 1, 2019. We've had conversations around this horseshoe about other you know, ordinances, other options that the council may want to consider that give tenants being displaced um, from expiring eviction properties priority and other affordable housing. That may be, you know, something to think about. Or, you know, if the Section 8 uh, voucher list opens up again, you know, applying for that. But basically, this is an extension. This is not a permanent solution. So there's no precedence that sets that, uh, you know, we have a we have other expiring covenants that are going to be in, in front of us any day. Mr. Lee, if I could ask you to just speak a little closer to the oh, mic. Sorry. I'm I having trouble hearing you. It could be a volume thing. Sorry. So we have other expiring covenants. Um, does this set any precedent set where we are, you know, they can point to this and say, well, you did this for them. Now you have to do it for us. Um, so a few months ago, the department sent our preservation program guidelines through um, committee and council, and one of the uh, interventions that we described was a covenant extension. We also took the list of at-risk, you know, of expiring covenants properties across the city's portfolio, 
and we divided them into the highest risk, you know, high market value areas where um, there isn't a, a HUD um, HAP contract that could be extended or different financing that could be extended. In total, there's about six properties with 500 and something units. This is basically one 20th of- Six in, properties and 500 units total. Total in the city that are in that high risk category. There's certainly, there's about 3,000 in total, but they are, most, most of these resolve because the owner comes to the department and seeks refinancing new tax credits, new tax exempt bonds, and, and we do that and they continue with their, extent, or they are like, um, uh, the Cathay Manor pro property in, in Chinatown that has a HUD um, contract that is tied to the building so that contract can be extended by HUD. There are, you know, and, and almost all of the ones that are the highest risk are of that community redevelopment agency era when they were first doing these kinds of loans. 30 years seemed like a really long time and so, you know, we did that and, and we're sort of facing that right now. If this property were not so high value and the owner was interested in acquiring it or in selling it, then you know that would be something. And the, some of those other 400 and so properties on the list, 400 units, are definitely acquirable. Um, but this one was not. Acquirable for the city? Yeah, if the city, well, not that the city itself would, would be the purchaser, but the city could be the financer of some nonprofit or the housing authority or some entity that wanted to preserve them as affordable housing to purchase them. And with the six months extension after that, how long do they have to repay their? Six years. Six years. And if somebody fails in that six years? Then, um, then they would, um, you know, if they fail to make the payment Shh, on the- Sorry, um, I'm gonna have to ask people who are here in the chambers to please be quiet. We are trying to have a discussion about allocating funding to this urgent program, I respectfully request your, your cooperation. Thank you. So the way the agreement is um, envisioned and is written right now, let's say a tenant was supposed to be paying $300 a month in the back rent and 1000 a month in the current rent, and at some point in year two, they stopped making, you know, they, they made a payment of only 1000 And it would be allocated first to the back rent and then to the new rent. Within some period of months of doing that, they would reach the, um, the tenant protections that the city has about you, you cannot be evicted until you owe sure. at least a month of fair market rent, and the owner would be able to file for eviction at that point. And at that point, since that unit or whatever is not covered, is there? So that unit is still covenanted. If that tenant were to leave, um, then the owner would have to find a new eligible low-income tenant and rent to that tenant at the, at the affordable rent. Okay. Any other question? Okay. Um, what, I, I had one additional question, which is you're proposing that we fund this from our affordable housing linkage fee dollars. Can you tell us the total number of affordable housing linkage fee dollars that we have available for the entire city this at this is a time? Big, this is a big chunk of our total affordable housing linkage fee overall. Right now, the balance in, across all the programs that the linkage fee is allocated to, new construction, preservation, home ownership, is about $100 million. So this is about 15% of that. Okay. Mr. Blumenfield. Well, just to break down your question a little bit more. Do we have a certain percentage that we put on preservation? Is this the entirety of, of the preservation amount? This is the, well, there's a little bit left, but fund, you know, functionally, yes, this is the entirety of the preservation amount. Yeah, I mean, it's now. a big commitment for, I mean, it, it's vulnerable folks that we're trying to help, but it's important to understand that, that what, what I'm hearing you say of the linkage fee, we have about 15% that can be used on, on preservation, which is a new idea. Um, and we're spending the entirety of it on this one building for the entire city. That's correct. And it, this is the amount of the affordable housing linkage fee amount has been collected over what period of time? Uh, this is the fifth year. Okay, so this is our annual collections is about 100 million? No, our annual collection is much lower than we predicted in part because we've passed the transit oriented communities um, program around the same time. and more people did on-site production of affordable housing than paid the linkage fee. 
So we're only bringing in about 25 million a year. Okay, so we, so this is 100 million collected over the past four years. We haven't expended none of our preservation dollars yet from that amount. And Correct. so you're recommending utilizing that preservation amount for this particular site at this time. Correct. Okay. Other questions? Go ahead, Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you, and I, uh, thank you to my colleagues. I, they asked a lot of the questions, and thank you, Anne, and your whole team for all your work uh, and time in this. Uh, how many other buildings across the city are we, or we might be kind of in similar circumstances on? Are, how many other buildings across the city are facing an expiring covenant without right. an easy, or maybe not easy, but Similar, feas similar circumstances. Feasible well, path. Um, without, which are not in the RSO, right? That, that's, which are that's, not in the that's, RSO, which do not have a Section 8 contract for the building by HUD. Um, right now, in that highest need area, we count 600 units, including this, all together in about six buildings. Okay. And then what, what do we have? What is, what's the number for back rent on this particular property? Um, it's about 1.4 million. It averages about 28,000 a unit. That's currently out. Got it. Okay. Thank you. 20. So not there's 106 units that we are covenanting. I believe that the back rent is owed by 48 of those. 48 of the units. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? We just had. The Supreme Court came out with that decision that puts potentially our linkage fee in, in jeopardy, um, which obviously would, would further restrict our ability to do these kinds of things, which are really important. Yeah, I mean, the, the linkage fee was the one of the only sources of funding that you've identified for preservation dollars in the city. There is potentially some more coming from ULA. Yes. But that particular pot of money is also at risk right now. Um, and I think this is a really challenging situation that we're dealing with. Um, Hillside Villa is far from the only building that's facing this very, very dire situation. The tenants here have testified in front of this committee and in front of council for a long time. Their situation is very, 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 um, very dire. And yet, there are only one portion of the people across the city who are facing this exact same situation. And I will tell you that I feel, when I got that report, I felt this way, and I feel that way today. I feel completely overwhelmed by the magnitude of the challenge ahead of us that we're going to face in this city. Um, I feel completely overwhelmed by the scale of housing insecurity that we're facing in Los Angeles. And even this particular resolution for this situation, as we heard from the tenants today, is challenging for them. It is only a 10-year extension from now, uh, leaving them potentially uh, in this exact same situation a decade later. That's the same offer that we'll be bringing to any other building that we're going to be extending housing covenants in. Um, we're hearing from tenants that they're going to have trouble paying back the back rent. I know that Councilmember Hernandez is working with them on that. And I'm hopeful that there can be a resolution on that back rent issue, which ensures that tenants are not facing risk. And I'm very, very hopeful about that outcome. But it is not an ideal situation. Uh, and so, yeah, I'll just tell you colleagues and, uh, and, and attendees today, I feel disheartened and overwhelmed by the situation that we find ourselves in as a city. Going forward, I know that we're changing our covenants and the way in which we're doing them so that we don't find ourselves in this situation again or as frequently, but, um, but we, that is the situation that we're in right now. Colleagues, do we have additional questions on this item? Seeing none, I'm going to recommend that we move it to the full council, um, approve it and move it to the full council. To attendees who are here from Hillside Villa, as I mentioned in our meeting earlier this week, this is not your last opportunity to speak to the council about this item. There is time between now and when it comes to full council, and I want to encourage everyone here to continue engaging with the council, and particularly with your council member, Council Member Hernandez, on this issue. I know she is working very, very hard to ensure that the issues that you brought up today 
are being addressed, and I have a lot of faith that we can get to a resolution that addresses your concerns. With that, um, uh, can you please call the roll? Yes, Madam Chair, and for the record, the recommendation is to approve the amended recommendations as stated into the record by the Los Angeles Housing Department. Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson, absent. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Aye. Four ayes. This item is approved as amended. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Next. And Madam Chair, does the committee wish to reconsider item one to continue Shh. to a date? Ma attendees, to I'm going to request that you please be quiet and please be respectful of what we're doing. I appreciate, I do respect you. Mr. Sachs, you're being warned. This is your last warning. If you speak out again, yeah. we're going to we ask you to vote? leave. Mr. Sachs. You've been warned, if you're not silent, you will be asked to leave. Okay, Mr. Sachs, you've been warned twice. I'm gonna ask that you now remove, be, uh, leave the chambers. You've spoken out of turn multiple times. Thank you for coming. If I may, Madam Chair, uh, does the committee wish to reconsider item one to continue to a date to be determined? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so we, do we have to vote to reconsider it? Uh, not for the continuance, ma'am, but uh, if, you, uh, if I may read the recommendations for items four through seven. I'm sorry, I'm not following. Uh, if I may, uh, Madam Chair, uh, read the recommendations for the uh, items four through seven adopted on consent. Yes, so sorry members, I made a mistake. Item one needs to be continued to our next meeting because it's the grand, which is an ongoing item that we'll hear. And so rather than voting it out of committee, we need to just vote to continue it. So we'll have to reconsider our consent items and vote on them one more time. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for item one, it's the recommendation is to note and file the city administrative officer report. Item five is to approve the city administrative officer report dated April 12, 2024, including the recommendation to note and file the Los Angeles Housing Department report dated April 3, 2024. I'm sorry, item, item one, apologize. The recommendation is to continue it, right? Not to note and file it. That is correct, Madam okay. Chair. Okay, thank you. And item uh, to restart, uh, item one is continue to a date to be, to be determined. Item four, is to note and file the city administrative officer report. Item five is to approve the city administrative officer report dated April 12, 2024, including the recommendation to note and file the Los Angeles Housing Depart Department report dated April 3rd, 2024. Item six is to approve the Los Angeles Housing Department report dated April 3rd, 2024. And item seven is to approve the municipal facilities Committee report dated April 11, 2024. Okay, thank you. And I think we can vote on those items now. Okay. Councilmember Roman? Yes. Councilmember Blumenfeld? Councilmember Harris Dawson, absent. Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Councilmember Lee? Aye. For ayes, these are items are approved as stated. Okay. Do we need to? Let's hear um, item three. Can you read this item into the record? Yes, Madam Chair. Item three is a motion Rodriguez Padilla relative to the creation of a department responsible for the development and management of the city's homelessness programs. Okay, great. Um, so I wanna just uh, thank Councilmember Rodriguez for uh, bringing this motion forward. Uh, I think anyone looking in from the outside at our city's homelessness response would be confused, <laughs> at minimum, on why it's organized in this particular way, or dare I say, not organized in any particular way, something we regularly lament in this committee. I think there's a lot of questions that come to mind when you're thinking about how we can 
centralize and create a coordinated response on the issue of homelessness. Uh, but I think a report back on this question that was uh, identified in this motion by Councilmember Rodriguez would really, really help address those. You know, how would centralizing our response help us to identify and eliminate redundancies, potential redundancies, around services like outreach? Um, how will a department or centralization of some kind mean potentially reducing some of the bureaucracy around homelessness rather than increasing it as creating a department seems to imply? Um, Ms. Councilmember Rodriguez, did you have any comments to make on the item? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, so thank you for scheduling the motion, Madam Chair. Um, I know this is an idea that several of us has raised. Uh, Councilmember De Leon initially did it in uh, 2022. And uh, Mr. Blumenfield, I know, like, again, this is not a new idea, but it's one when we continue to see uh, so much money being dis uh, managed by so many different efforts, efforts uh, out through the CAO's office to the mayor's office, uh, you've got, you know, the resources that we provide to LASA. We have a very scattered approach uh, that, frankly, does cause a, lot, a number of redundancies and, um, and, and expense that if we had a centralized system that we could better measure outcomes, efficacy, and derive greater efficiencies from. So um, I want to thank, you know, I, this is, again, a... a um, a long overdue conversation uh, when, you know, when, uh, when there is uh, continued frustration uh, with the lack of trans uh, transparency around uh, outcomes associated with the efforts that we've funded, uh, particularly when it comes to outreach. This is a means of us uh, being able to hold one entity accountable, uh, have outcomes measured, and uh, basically have greater accountability than what we have right now. And that's just the, the fact of the matter is that this is, this is the frustration we continue to bear. I think as we're looking at uh, the onslaught of audits that are, ref that are revealing uh, some really egregious expenditures, it's offensive. It's offensive. Uh, the amount of money that frankly feels like it's just being squandered and um, and really misused. And so uh, as we continue to have those examples revealed, I think it calls uh, for even greater urgency for us to have a centralized uh, agency, a department that actually manages it so that we take it out of uh, political hands, centralize it as a department and core function of the city. Uh, but more importantly, I think it's part of a greater move that we need to make because as we continue to struggle with even uh, other levels of government whose uh, role also is part of our homelessness response, we need to begin the efforts of, of centralizing this work in a, in a manner that we can measure uh, outcomes and achieve greater efficiencies and controls over. So again, thank you for scheduling this item. I look forward to, um, I look forward to the report back and, and beginning us on this journey. And uh, again, thanks. Again, not not a novel idea, but it's one that we just we need to we need to stop. Uh, you know, resources getting further constrained, and again, uh, from the onslaught of federal audits or other audits that are revealing uh, so many of the uh, egregious expenditures. I think we have an obligation uh, to really start tightening it up and uh, and being far you know ensuring greater transparency with the use of the dollars that have been availed to the city. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Rodriguez. Any other comments from members of the committee? Mr. Lee, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Councilman Rodriguez. I, I share your concerns in, in the accountability piece, uh, how the city uh, is continually spending, spending money, uh, some people feeling frustrated that they're not seeing the results in their communities, uh, so that we can actually get a handle on what, where, where is the money going to. Uh, my my one concern, and I hope that the report uh, discusses this, is right now we are treating this, you know, we're trying to treat this as the emergency that it is, right? And that this is all within every single one of our departments seems to be dealing with some sort of aspect of uh, the, home, the homelessness crisis that we're dealing with. Just how 
that would work? Are we then pulling those resources? Are they the same sort of resources that we expend for those departments that are going to be put towards this department? You know, obviously, we, you know, we know the budget year that we are we are facing, and you know, starting up a new department. I just want to make sure we understand fully as a council, you know, how you know where this funding is going to going to be coming from. Um, just you know, you know. The idea of the Department of Homelessness, this is a crisis that we're hoping to end. <laughs> you know, it's not an ongoing, right, an ongoing thing. Um, you know, so just to make sure that we are really trying to look at, you know, what benefits, but also just how we are going to just really look at how the city operates as a whole, you know, regarding all of the different things. And that's just, you know, I hope that this report reflects all that. Percent, and I just and, and Mr. Lee, thank you for that. Um, you know, when we start thinking about homelessness, and I, you know, I, I just turned 50 this year. I can't remember a time, uh, you know, since uh, you know my my parents we would drive through and Skid Row when I was a little girl. Uh, the circumstances have only gotten severely worse and uh, gone into you know obviously morphed into dynamics that are not just affecting the city of Los Angeles. This is unfortunately something that's become a national uh, trend. And so, I, you know, yes, I would love for the day that we could see an end to this, uh, but unfortunately not, not since the early 1900s, have we, you know, we have been seeing this here in the city of Los Angeles. And so I, I suspect that, again, going back to the goal is, because setting up a department is obviously no small feat. I think the reality is, is that given what we are seeing in terms of expenditures that are being squandered and misused as, as is being reflected through a number of reports and audits that are coming out, uh, we have an obligation uh, that we can achieve greater efficiencies and accountable outcome, uh, hold some accountability and, and uh, measured outcomes associated with the work and uh, making sure that we're holding people's feet to the fire. But I agree with you completely. Thank, Thank you, you, Council Member. Any other comments? Okay, um, Ms. Rodriguez, I had uh, an am am amendment for the item which we've discussed um, prior. It changes nothing about the original intent of it. So I'm just gonna read um, the amendment, which is to replace the current instruction with the following. I therefore move that the city council instruct the CLA with the assistance of the city attorney, the CAO, the housing department, and LASA to evaluate the creation of a city department of homelessness or other means of centralizing coordination and oversight of the following, as well as other issues identified by the CLA. The coordination of city-funded outreach deployments, including those related to sanitation and encampment response, and coordination with the county. The identification and development of potential sites for interim and permanent housing. Collection of real-time data related to homelessness and accountability of service providers. Contracting processes, emergency response, and homelessness prevention. Um, so, uh, do I have a second for that amendment? Thank you. And uh, I'd like to vote on that uh, amendment, sorry, that item as amended, Mr. Bencomo. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, and for the record, uh, the recommendation is to approve the Department of City Planning report dated March 13th, sorry, 2024. Sorry, no, 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 this is item three. It's just a motion. Yeah, so it'll just be moving, approving the motion as amended by the committee. Okay. Councilmember Robin. Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Aye. Five ayes. This item is approved. Great. Thank you very much. Now we'll move on to our last item, uh, item two. And Mr. Bencoma, if you could read that item into the record. Yes, Madam Chair. Item two is a Department of City Planning reports relative to an enforcement analysis of the home sharing ordinance and development of a centralized digital monitoring an enforcement database or platform and of a publicly accessible online database or platform of home sharing registrations and related matters. Great, and we, I believe we have uh, Department of City Planning here for a brief presentation. They've issued a supplemental report to their previous report. Um, I have some questions and then I have uh, some requests for additional information and I hope to come back to the committee to discuss that additional information in the coming weeks, and hopefully we can make some progress. 
Welcome. Another PowerPoint. Um, good yep. afternoon, council members. My name is Joanne Lim from the Department of City Planning. And uh, yes, and I just want to make sure everyone at the table is introducing themselves because I know there's people not just from planning here. Good afternoon, Elisa Weber, uh, Deputy Director with the Department of City Planning. Great. Good afternoon, committee members. Frank Lara with Building and Safety, Director of Government and Community Relations. Hi, Frank. Trisha Keen, Executive Officer of the Housing Department. Uh, Robert Gillardi, Code Enforcement Director. Thank you very much, sorry. Please continue. All right, thank you. Um, on eight, October 18, 2023, this committee considered a report from City Planning regarding the administration and enforcement of the Home Sharing Ordinance. City Planning's initial report recorded, provided a background of the Home Sharing Program, identified challenges, and provided recommendations for better enforcement. In our report, city planning provided an update on the progress of the program. To recap, with implementation of the HSO, short-term rental listings were down significantly as our exemptions claimed on short-term rental listings. Uh, we've continued to process large volumes of applications and inquiries, and our enforcing agencies have issued more than 1,000 citations. The home sharing program consists of two major components, administration and enforcement. City planning's role mainly has to do with program administration, processing home sharing registrations, handling inquiries, and so forth. City planning can suspend, modify, or revoke registrations in certain cases. When it comes to enforcement, city planning supports the citation issuing agencies by issuing warning letters, referring potential violations to the appropriate agency for citation, and responding to appeals and attending administrative hearings. Home sharing citations are processed through the Administration Citation Enforcement Program, also known as ACE. Home sharing citations are currently issued only when a short-term rental listing without a valid registration number appears on a platform. As you can see in the image here, home sharing citations involve multiple steps and require significant cross-agency coordination. In our report, home, uh, city planning also described home sharing challenges that persist in three key areas, organization, administration, and enforcement. Organizational challenges stem from decentralized responsibilities distributed between multiple city agencies. Administrative challenges include verifying information on hosts and properties for, example, primary residence documentation. Enforcement challenges are due to a lengthy process to cite a property compounded by difficulties in documenting and investigating violations. City planning submitted a supplemental report on March 13, 2024 in response to questions from the committee regarding our initial report. In that report, we include a discussion of the staffing needs of city planning and the housing department some clarification of the requirements for administrative citations versus administrative subpoenas, a discussion of how the city can compel hosting platforms to provide more data, <coughs> options for updating registration fees and administrative fines, more options and strategies for improving enforcement, and ways to streamline the processing of applications. In terms of recommendations, the operational challenges can be addressed without further council action this includes updating the home sharing administrative guidelines, eliminating warning letters, and other steps that city planning can take using the authority that's been delegated to the department. Responding to the organizational challenges requires some shifting of responsibilities and resources between agencies. Most notably, we recommend this council explore creating a dedicated division office or department responsible for home sharing administration and enforcement. An update to fees and fines is also recommended. Additional report backs on staffing, funding, and policy recommendations from the relevant agencies will also be needed. City planning proposes to address some of the administrative challenges through the aforementioned administrative guidelines update. However, we have identified other changes that will require an amendment to the home sharing ordinance. Our recommendations for this amendment include prohibiting home sharing altogether in ADUs and on 
units that are on RSO properties, as well as disallowing extended home sharing. And that concludes our presentation right now. Thank you. Um, do any of the other departments have additional feedback at this time? Thank you so much. You know, I think one of, we had asked a number of questions to city planning primarily when the last time that we heard this item. We also heard from a lot of neighbors of short-term rentals. We heard from uh, short-term rental hosts. Um, and we heard from community members overall who were worried about things like the skyrocketing cost of rent here in the city of Los Angeles and their fears about how the short-term rental market is playing out. We also heard from people who have properties near them where criminal activities have happened, where dangerous situations have come up, where shootings have taken place. And we see that particularly in hillside neighborhoods. In my district, Council District 5 has seen this, multiple incidents of this. We know that many hosts go to extraordinary lengths to ensure that they're in compliance with our local laws. And one of the things that I continue to be frustrated by and want to understand, you know, it's not part of this process, but it is something that we need to do. We deal constantly in our office with hosts who find it very, hosts who are following the law, who find it very, very hard to just maintain or renew their registration. And we end up case managing those situations over and over again. And I'm not sure why there, are, there is such a disjuncture between hosts who are following the rules, who are submitting all the required information, why it often takes them months to renew their registration. We have to address that as part of this process. We have to. If we're asking for people to follow the rules, and they are, we have to also hold up our end of the bargain. And I think that's absolutely imperative as we move through this. Um, and my goal as we've moved through this entire process has not been to punish short-term rental owners. It is really to be focused on those short-term rental hosts who are violating these laws. We want to enforce these regulations. We've seen over and over again, we have neighborhoods in my district. We have, I think, the largest number of short-term rental units in my district as a percentage of our total units. So it's an issue that we feel very, very keenly. We have so many units where we know that the owner is not actually living there and they're still renting the facility as, as a short-term rental. Uh, and it has been an ongoing challenge for our neighborhood. And for some people, they are surrounded by these units, whether in their apartment building or in their uh, single-family home neighborhood. And I think for really, for us, we want to make sure that we are creating a system that treats owners that are following the rules fairly, but that allows us to go after people who are not operating their units appropriately. Um, with that, I want to ask a couple of questions, open it up for question, uh, questions from my colleagues. And then I have a few instructions for the departments that are here for questions that I didn't feel like the reports have answered so far that I think we need in order for us to be able to um, uh, reform the ordinance and to resource these departments appropriately. Because it's taken us so long to get here, I'm going to ask that these instructions, that we, these questions that we're asking, that the departments bring this information back to our next meeting, which will not happen for a little bit because of the budget uh, process. And so I think we'll have six weeks uh, before our next meeting. And so I'm going to ask that departments take that time to bring answers to these questions back. And I'll read those in questions later. But um, let's start with um, uh, the discretionary modification process uh, and our revocation process. How often have we done those? Uh, and what does that process look like? What kind of interdepartmental communication does that require? Uh, so there, for registered properties, there's a ministerial suspension and revocation process where in which if a registered property and the registered host um, is issued a requisite number of citations, that registration can be revoked or suspended. Um, in terms of how many we've been able to revoke or suspend, at this time we have revoked one registration. The entire time that the ordinance has been in place? Right, yes. But with the additional uh, staffing that we've acquired, um, you know, before the hiring freeze, we were able to um, fill four of those, like, uh, four of those posi yeah, four of those positions. And so as we're able to get through the backlog and to get through our day-to-day -day programming, um, you know, one of our goals with that additional staffing is to build up um, more frequent 
uh, review of registered property so that we can proactively revoke and suspend those registrations, um, along with the coordination of receiving that data from the other uh, citation issuing departments. And can you tell us a little bit more about the process of revocation? Why has, I mean, it feels like there are a number of non-compliant properties and that more than one should have been eligible for revocation right, through this right. time? Um, so in terms of, like, as I mentioned, if we can proactively on a more frequent, like on a monthly or weekly basis, if we have, when, if we had the resources and the staffing available, um, what we could, what we could do and we could, um, is essentially just review properties, uh, get the, citations from the citation issuing uh, departments and if they meet a requisite number of citations for example if a host has a regular home sharing registration which only allows for 120 day nights if they receive two citations during that registration period that registration will be suspended for 30 days or until all citations are closed out if they are issued three citations, then they are, um, that registration will be revoked and that host will be banned from the home sharing program for a year. For uh, registered hosts that have an extended home sharing registration, it only takes two citations issued for us to be able to revoke the registration and ban the host from the program for two years. Um, as you know, we've received a lot of complaints about properties, and that's the number one thing that we check for um, in terms of the properties that we've received complaints about is how many citations have been issued to that property. I think there are multiple times where um, if there were complaint, there may be complaints made, but there's not an open violation. We unfortunately can't proceed with that ministerial process. What does that mean? What's the difference between a complaint being made and an open violation? So a citation would have to be issued to the property. That's an open violation? Is a citation? As defined in the home sharing ordinance. Uh, so for example, uh, there's a, a party at a home sharing uh, a, a property. Uh, the police are called. They come out. Uh, what we have learned is that there is a fairly high threshold for a citation to actually be written. And so as part of our task force... I'm sorry, who set that threshold? Or what do you mean there's a fairly high threshold for a citation to actually be written? Well, I don't that's understand just that. generally our practice is what we've seen, that oftentimes the police are called by the time they arrived. Maybe the, the crowd in the street, the street has dissipated, uh, uh, parked cars have moved, uh, the, the noise or music has been turned down. Uh, when LAPD arrives and they're fairly successful in addressing the situation, it doesn't often escalate to a, to a point where a citation has been issued. And unfortunately, that doesn't help us in terms of us creating that paper trail to get us to kind of that threshold. So how, does, how do complaints reflect in this process? What happens when a community member makes a complaint? Part of the, the you know, the setup that we have is that there is a complaint line that is 24 7 you can call it at any time what happens to complaints that are coming in are they attached to particular properties is there a way of taking complaints that are coming in from residents and using it to do anything to that property owner right so the purpose of that complaint line is for um registered property, so if a constituent um, finds that there's a nuisance in their neighborhood due to a short-term rental, they call that 24-7 complaint line. If that property is registered, what will happen is that uh, the contact for that registration will be contacted uh, in real time, alerting them that a complaint has been lodged so that they can go and handle the nuisance in real time as the call is being made. Um, that's the purpose of that 24-7 complaint line. I think one of the issues that um, you know, you're know you bringing up is the challenges that we're facing with home sharing enforcement. Once again, if a complaint comes, uh, I, I think one of the, the challenges we're facing with uh, home sharing enforcement is that there's not currently a centralized portal for all of the violations that are associated with home sharing activity or short-term rental activity. Um, you know, when there's an activity on the property that's usually associated with short-term rentals, it could be noise, which is enforced by LAPD. It could be a parking or a street being blocked, which would be, be LEDOT or street services. So one of the, our recommendations really reflect that challenge. I think that you're bringing up as to like who gets the complaints and who, how are, how are we holistically 
um, resolving those matters. At this time right now, when we do get complaints, um, city planning will check to see if any citations have been issued, whether a property is registered or not registered, and we'll refer that property to the appropriate agency to have them um, investigate further if, um, you know, since they have that enforcement authority. So if a complaint comes in and there, there's no open citation from the LAPD, but it's a complaint that's related to something that's investigated by DBS, then you refer a complaint that comes in through the complaint line to DBS? Um, one more time? If a complaint comes in through the complaint line, is that automatically referred to DBS if it's, if it's something that DBS is supposed to be reviewing? No, not at this time, because that complaint line is mostly for registered properties. Um, when somebody calls in that hotline, they are actually given information to those enforcement agencies, and they're instructed, if it's a noise violation, please contact the non-emergency phone number. If it's a code violation, please contact LADBS. Um, they're given that information and they're instructed to contact the appropriate agencies uh, before, at the beginning of that call to the complaint line. So there's no one like driving? Well, when we receive complaints via email or phone calls, then we do drive that. Okay, so just not through the complaint line? No. But if you get a complaint via email about a property that's non-compliant, then you refer them to the enforcement agencies for investigation. Yes. Right, it just feels confusing, I think, for right. the public right. that sees two different pathways to providing a complaint, one that results in seemingly very little happening, right. um, and one that potentially could result in something happening if they follow up enough times right. and are seeing. Um, how do daily fines get administered? Um, can you remind us how much we've collected over the last five years? Sorry, let me get that number for you right now. Uh, as of since November 1st, 2019, uh, it looks like $360,000 and $360,000 have been collected. Since 2019. Okay. And how many total complaints have come in about properties? We've received about 9,129 complaint calls calls in the complaint, the 24-7 complaint mm -hmm. line? And what about emails coming to you? Um, we, one second. I don't have that figure with me, but I can follow up with you on that. Okay, it's useful. Do other committee members have questions? I wanna monopolize the time. Mr. Bloomfield. Yeah, um, so the complaints, it's very strange. The complaint lines and the, I mean, is there a way to integrate all that so it all happens so all the complaints can go through a central source? Right, so I think that was part of um, one of the discussions that we had in our supplemental report and also our report in that because the enforcement is so decentralized, um, we wanted to also look into the, you know, explore the options of how we can centralize um, the way that we intake the complaints so that that information could be referenced to the appropriate agencies. Right. And, and how can the public track it? So if I, I right. make a complaint, email or otherwise, it, it just goes into the ether. There's no, there's no risk feedback, and then you know the constituents who make the complaint will feel like they're being ignored, even if they're not. Yeah, Councilmember, I think that it's really probably a combination of uh, organizational structure, as Joanne mentioned, but also some technology enhancements uh, to really kind of address all of the uh, elements of of home sharing and all of the ways that a property. Uh, could be in violation. Yeah, it's just it's frustrating that we're still having these conversations and we passed this a long time ago and I feel like we should be further along on, on some of that stuff. And, uh, you know, and the, uh, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I support a private right of action. We have a separate movement toward that so that, especially with the um, 
the non-registered listings, that there's got to be a better way to go after them. Because in some ways, we're creating a perverse incentive for people not to register because mm -hmm. the complaints don't get charged against them, so to speak. Um, but Sorry, Mr. Bloomfield, could I ask a question about that, actually? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about non-registered listings and what happens when a non-registered listing has a complaint about it related to short-term rentals? Yes. So for non-registered properties, um, we have a, a software system that monitors short-term re sh short rental listings on uh, major platforms that have 100 or plus listings. And so what, our system, what the software system does is it will track the listing to ensure that it's a short-term rental, it's non-compliant, um, that if that system captures evidence that there is a non-compliant short-term rental listing, that system will automatically flag that. And so as of right now, the current process is city planning will refer those properties to building and safety if there is evidence for a citation to be issued. So what does that mean? So um, if there's a, a, a short-term rental listing that doesn't display a valid registration number, so it's not compliant. Um, we will, within the system, refer that property over to our colleagues in building and safety. If it's a single family home or to housing department, it's a, if it's a multifamily building. And one of their code enforcement officers will review that listing, verify that there is an identified violation on the property, and they will then authorize that citation. And what does that verification process look like of an identified violation? Well, what we're doing is really taking a, a snapshot of a moment in time uh, with these listings uh, up, you know, on, on various platforms. And a lot of the uh, hosts that have been successful in evading uh, our ordinance and the regulations have been very successful in providing those listings and taking them down and, you know, playing a, a bit of a chess game. Uh, and so, but we are catching these, and the minute that we do catch it, that's really, you know, evidence that we have that's, um, you know, time stamped that then either building and safety or the housing department can use to take the next step. And so can you talk, Department of Building and Safety and Housing Department, could you talk about the next steps for what happens when you receive this kind of violation? Yes, uh, Frank Lara, Building and Safety. So um, we... Uh, once the, a, um, a, a, a screenshot that's being followed by the, by the software system, once it evolves to a certain point, it's sent over to our inspector at Building and Safety. Um, we actually um, view that, that screenshot within, within a, few, a number of days, few few days. Um, really what they do, they look at a screenshot on the screen, uh, they search for a registration number. If that registration does not exist, then we have a process to forward that over to city attorney for an A citation, and the A citation gets issued. Um, and it's actually a very simple process, very simple. I think we've issued well over 500? Uh, we, we issued over 1,000 at this Over 1,000, uh, and Combined, between, yeah. between, the, between all of us. But it's, it's actually kind of the low-hanging fruit of enforcement because you're taking the advertisement from the screenshot and, and able to issue a, uh, a citation with uh, very little investigation. It just feels small to me, though. That number feels really small, that over the course of the five years, you would have only issued 1,000 ACE citations. Given the number of properties that are non-compliant, that are on these other platforms. So I, I appreciate that it's a fairly straightforward process. I'm, I'm glad that it's straightforward. But the results don't seem to show that it's that straightforward. And I do want to say, the last time that you were here, which was in October, you mentioned that we had about 980 citations that were done, and now it's, what month is it? My God. April? And now we have 1,000. So we've issued like 20 citations over six months. Oh, no. Um, we've issued over roughly around 100 since October. Okay. Still, it still feels like a fairly small number. So just curious about why, you know, does every citation, does every listing that's non-compliant receive a citation? And if not, why not? Um, one of the issues and one of the challenges that we originally had was just staffing and resource, a lack of staffing and resources. Uh, since we were approved that those 10 additional positions. Yeah, sorry. But the, the process appears to be that you get software, software, 
sends you images of non-compliant listings, you forward those images to Department of Building and Safety. Department of Building and Safety reviews them again, and then they send them to the city attorney's office. Right. Where so, would a staffing shortage prevent this from? Yeah, no, so before we refer it over to Building and Safety and Housing, what city planning does is we just make sure that we review that property, what's actually the established use. Um, we check to see if the property's registered or not, if the host, if the property owner has contacted us to figure out a way to come into compliance. Um, we do all of that before we send that over to Building and Safety and Housing. The other challenge that we're facing in terms of enforcement is because um, a lot of times, some of these issues is just capturing the uh, listing itself. A lot of times, these uh, uh, violators will remove and repost and remove and repost the listing. So capturing the screenshot sometimes can be can be tricky. Um, but you know, it's it, it's not just like a simple like five minute task. It it takes around roughly like an hour for city planning staff to review just like the background, ensuring that we're providing building and safety and housing the right information so that they can review that quickly and generate that citation. Go ahead. Um, and you only look at when there's been a complaint, right? Um, or or do, we, do we have somebody searching? The goal is to be proactive about it. Um, once again, since we have those, that additional staffing and we're able to get through the backlog of our applications and our emails, our goal is to be able to proactively take a look at the non-compliant listings and try to issue. Uh, I mean, shouldn't that be like money making? I mean, it's, yes. a, it's like a, uh, I don't want to say meter made. What's the word for meter made? Then uh, the right word now. Uh, <laughs> parking Traffic enforcement. enforcement. Uh, it's, I mean, parking. it pays for itself. Right, you have that, uh, shouldn't you have, the more people you hire, the more money you're making on this? Well, I think that speaks to the, the challenge that we've had, that you know, the planning department has been very focused on uh, the beginning of the process, that registration, and answering uh, customer uh, questions via email, via, via phone, getting through those registrations, uh, enforcement, we, we're just now getting the resources to really be more proactive with that. I think this just really speaks to the challenge that we have. The planning department can't in and of itself automatically send um, uh, these violators uh, to the ACE unit with a citation for, for processing because Sorry. we do not have that enforcement authority. That's why we're working so closely with building and safety and with the housing department. So again, it really speaks to if we had one entity, one umbrella that really had that level of authority. Uh, to address really all aspects of the work program, there, there would clearly be efficiencies realized. Is the, how much is the citation anyway? Like how much do you, if you successfully get through the system, what do you, what do you it's like a thousand or something? For, for non-listings is what I'm talking about. You go, you go after someone who wasn't listing. Right. And, and while you're looking at that, besides Airbnb, what other platforms are listing? Um, there's multiple uh, platforms that are out there. There's VRBO, um, HomeAway, there's um, FlipKey. So, uh, but you're monitoring, all of those are being monitored as well? Uh, we're, we are monitoring platforms that ha have over 100 plus listings. So if it's a major platform, um, are we, our system should be monitoring that, and if not, then we... Who's monitoring it? The host compliance software. And then they send you the listings. No, so it's like a database of listings, so we're just monitoring that database. And then you review every violation that's identified in that database, and then you send it over to DBS? So that would, once again, because that would be like a really large database, I think there's about, about 100 thousand plus listings that the the software has been able to identify and so we utilize that software to be able to filter the data to be able to flag which listings are non-compliant or compliant so since a lot of this activity is so there's a hundred thousand non-compliant listings no, no 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 I'm saying that this system has identified 
100,000 plus short-term rental listings, some which are compliant, some which are not compliant. And so we utilize that software to be able to identify the non-compliant listings. Right, so once you get the non-compliant listings, how many of those are there? Um, I don't think I have that data right now. But Just an estimate. As, you know, you, you've, you've worked with this. Just to, uh, order of magnitude. I think at the time we have about 9,000 plus compliant listings. Okay. 9,000 compliant out of a total of? Out of 100,000 that are non-compliant. No, 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 no. Um, I would rather, like, follow up with that information, but I don't. No, the 100,000 listings is like the history of all listings since we started capturing them since 2019. Right, but host compliance is supposed to provide you a report with the non-compliant listings, right? Right. So I'm just curious on, what, they issue that report every week? Or? No, um, they were, they, it's on a monthly basis, but I can see how many are non-compliant. They issue you that report on a monthly basis. Every month, how many units are they identifying that are non-compliant? Okay, so I think, um, thank you. There's about 14,190 active short-term rental listings that have been identified as of March 5th, 2024. And since there's about 4,075 4, active home sharing registrations, um, that can contribute to the number of listings that are compliant. But, oh, sorry. So I didn't follow that. That, that sounds like ten, there's 15,000 total. 5,000 approximately are, are, not, are compliant. That means there are 10,000 that are not compliant. Oh, two I'm thir sorry. Two-thirds are non-compliant? Right, no, sorry. It's 4,874 are compliant short-term rental listings, and there's about 8,196 non-compliant listings. So this it's like 50-50. Mm -hmm. So half are compliant and half are non-compliant. Right. And so of that 8,000, how many are you sending over to DBS? So of that 8,000, one of the issues is we also have to identify the address to, for building and safety and housing to be able to even issue the citation. So one of the issues with the 8,000 number is some of that is due to us being, or the system, being unable to identify the address. Right, so if, so if, if somebody puts a, I'm sorry. No, no, you go ahead. Please, we're asking the same question. If, so, if someone lists, instead of putting their address on it, they say, you know, bedroom community by the beach, you know, and then right. they, then you're never going to know, and because they're going to then have to send an individual note to the person to get the exact address, which is also why how a lot of folks who uh, will use a fake address of a of a nearby city, and then when they actually send it, like, oh yeah, we actually we're not really in Inglewood, we're right. we're here, you know, and so there's a lot of ways that people beat the system right, by, the, by not being specific on their address, and we don't seem to have a way to really cure that. So if I may, those are the kind of situations that would require a significant amount of staff time to do individual investigation. Um, that could be if you can recognize the picture of the house in a listing and drive up and down the street until you find it and it looks the same. And that's the kind of thing where you do question whether that's an efficient use of staff time for that particular violation. How about, how about offering a bounty? Seriously, I mean, I, you know, I've talked about the private right of action, which is the, the legal way to do that, but maybe we don't have to go that full route. Maybe we could have a bounty system out there where we open it up to the world, identify, you know, snitch on your, on your, your, your neighbor and get paid and, and. But I mean, we, we have the snitching happening. <laughs> yeah, no, we do. I'm just saying, but, but no why, why not have, why not set it up formally so that it doesn't take any staff time? The public can be incentivized to, there's lots of people out there who have every reason to identify, you know, and typically they're not going to care about the ones that aren't causing problems, they're going to care about the ones that are causing problems. I, I think an approach to that would involve understanding specifically what kind of information could be submitted from a, from a neighbor or other source in public that would rise the level of um, usable Yes. evidence in an enforcement case and so that's something that would be helpful to get guidance from for instance a city attorney on 
Um, I and then that, that may be an avenue for getting additional usable information. Right. And if, we, if we had a bounty, someone could make a little extra cash, just call up each of these, these ambiguous sites, say, hey, exactly, where is your address? And then have that email, send us the emails, and then they can make a little percentage. Kind of like our key TAM law uh, that we have, you know, whistleblower law, where we, we, um, we get we get the and that was my law on the state level, where we, we get the public to to report when the the government's being ripped off, and we've made billions of dollars back for the state doing that. This is a very slightly different version of that, but yeah, we could do it. I think we could do it. Um, you have a question, Mr. Harris Dawson? Yes. I'm, I'm, for, uh, I'm for bounty hunting. Um, <laughs> I second that. Um, I, you know, I just, I share all of the confusion that there is about enforcement. Um, you know, not only I'm a member of the council, this is very personal for me because I live about, a, I don't know, five minute bike ride from SoFi, the Forum, and that other stadium that they're building. And so there's, we have a lot of Airbnb. So a couple of things, one is, you residents make complaints and it's not clear at all what happens mm -mm. from the point of view of the neighbor something could very well be happening to the owner but no one in the neighborhood knows that something has happened the other thing with just a little bit of investigation uh, from my staff just on a laptop we found 12 houses in my neighborhood where the same people apparently live in all 12 houses. They literally use the same picture on their, on the site when they say who the owner operator is and neither of them look like people who live in the neighborhood. I'll just put it that way. Um, so <laughs> we give all this information and this is the council member and the staff, we give all this information and it goes into, for what, uh, for what we can see, a black hole. Like, we never get anything back. We don't know if those, I mean, we know those houses are still operating because we can see them with our eyes, but no one calls back and says anything. There's no website that says this place has been cited. Everybody, if you live in this neighborhood, you should look out for it. There's, there's no kind of, um, the, the, one, the system is very opaque, and this, it seems like the city doesn't use its best asset which is the neighbors uh, in the pursuit of managing these, uh, managing these properties. So I, I just wanted to hear in the context of this labyrinth of enforcement mechanisms, uh, when do the people who call in or the neighbors of this house get to know any, that anything has happened? Um, so I, I think that's one of the challenges that we're facing, right, is that we don't, when because city planning is not an enforcement agency, we aren't able to actually issue the citation. We're not able to, um, uh, you know, we don't, we are not able to verify the, the, the violation or inspect or investigate. Um, a lot of times, like we work with our colleagues at building and safety or housing, or, um, you know, we try to contact senior lead officers if they can, um, follow up on those properties. Um, but as of right now, that challenge is still remains is that um, because there's the types of violations that can occur on the property are so very, uh, there's so many different uh, departments involved. Um, you know, we're, we've made that recommendation of having a more centralized office or division where if a complaint does come in, um, yeah. Well, so again, I would just push for creativity on this. Um, so I'll give you another example. Um, one of my neighbors, their kid crashed their car and they parked the totaled car in the driveway and it's sitting there. So that's blight. But when that got reported by a neighbor, we all got a letter saying this address is not supposed to have that car there. We've cited them and they have so many days to move the car, blah, 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 blah. So like it clearly can be done um, without, and you know, there was no, we need to hire people or we need a special unit to monitor, you know, uh, junk cars or blighted vehicles and driveways. It, it just kind of happened. Um, and this, and I'll just say this, the home sharing is much more an issue 
than the, the types of things that we do get notices for as neighbors. So, and with that, I'll stop. No, those are really good, really good points. Mr. Lee, did you have questions? Yeah, just out of curiosity, since the ordinance passed, I know the numbers you're telling us, but since the ordinance passed, how many listings do you feel like, I mean, you're working with the different companies to find out how many listings since the ordinance has passed have they, that they've voluntarily taken down? Do we have any idea what those numbers look like? Well, only one, only one company actually voluntarily takes down listings, right? Right. Um, the Airbnb has a platform agreement with the city of Los Angeles and through an application programming interface, um, they are able to have like a digital link to our database to know what properties do have valid registrations. And if a host were to try to create a listing on Airbnb, um, if that property is not validly registered with the property at the time, that listing gets taken down. So, but do we have an idea of what that number is? I mean, to like, what, what, what is? Well, given that Airbnb, I believe, takes about like 65% of the listings. Um, I don't have that figure. Like, okay. so just to be clear, like, is the question how many listings has Airbnb taken down yeah, I mean, due to the API? Do, yeah, exactly. Okay. And I'm, I'm assuming that we work directly with um, you know, if we find out issues like the address issue, right? Like they're outside Los Angeles. I mean, they're inside Los Angeles, but they're using an outside address and things like that. Are you, are we working directly with them to address some of those issues? And has, has that been yes. successful? Do we feel like they're, they are complying and being good partners for this? Yes, um, so we meet with Airbnb on like a monthly basis to address those concerns. And that issue has been play, flagged um, of, you know, hosts that are doing that bait and switch, maybe they're advertising one property, but they're, you know, sending somebody out to another property, um, listings where they're misidentifying the location so that they're not getting flagged by the API and not being asked to provide that valid registration number. Um, it's still a work in progress, um, but we are working towards um, trying to find a solution to that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Mr. Blumenfield. Yeah. Are there more, th are there, is there additional leverage that we can exert to uh, require the other platforms to do at the very least what Airbnb is doing in terms of, I know this, this was an issue early on that we, that we couldn't mandatorily do it, but surely there's some leverage that we have to, to try to make that happen on a larger right. basis. I, I think trying to get a platform agreement is a difficult challenge, however, um, you know, one of the, I think, um, actions that the city has taken through the city attorney is issuing administrative subpoenas um, against uh, platforms that, you know, the city may suspect of not complying with the home sharing ordinance. Uh, we issued about five, five of those administrative subpoenas to five different platforms back in 2021, one of which resulted in a lawsuit. Um, people versus home away uh, slash VRBO. And through that lawsuit, um, there was a settlement agreement which included a compliance program with VRBO, which um, they are working with the city attorney's office to show compliance with. Yeah, what about that? If we, if we had, I like the way you're going down that road, if, if we had a certain number of citations on a platform that we then said, okay, you're, you're shut down um, unless you you give us an agreement because you have too many sites, you know, you have, you violated the law too many times. Um, because as of right now, the home sharing ordinance, when it relates to hosting platform um, requirements, um, they are not required to take down listings that are not compliant. Um, the ordinance actually just speaks to that they cannot allow a booking transaction for a, you know, property that's not registered. But and why is that? Is that was that a failure on our part in drafting it, or is that uh, there's a legal reason why we can't? Um, there's a legal reason why. Um, there, I, I believe when they adopted that ordinance, there were some challenges to that, especially when it comes to the Communications Decency Act. Um, they found that platforms um, are cannot really right, they can't take down listings due to the content. Um, but what, what, they, what the city attorneys found, and what we've adopted in the ordinance, is that we can actually. Um, you know, require them in uh, require them in regards to the booking transactions. 
Yeah, and I would just recommend that when we do come back, I think the participation of the city attorney's office in this conversation is uh, really critical yes. to um, getting some of these answers and uh, understanding the, 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 all of the options on the table from an enforcement standpoint. So that is part of the reason why. So I'm going to read a set of instructions into the record. I'm going to ask departments that are here to come back to our next meeting with these answers, either in written form or in a report form. I'm not particular. I've also asked the same of the city attorney. The city attorney was also requested to come to this meeting. Um, they expressed some concerns uh, related to attendance for a number of reasons, which I'm, I'm I understand, but what we've said is we'll put our questions in writing and that they'll provide that feedback in the manner that, that they feel that they can provide that feedback. So I'm going to read these instructions um, and I look forward to reconvening at our next meeting uh, with hopefully some of these questions answered because I think part of what has been challenging about this process is, you know, I think all of us on this committee work very, very closely with all of our departments, uh, you know, and I. I think if I hadn't been an elected representative, I probably would have been working for the Department of City Planning. You know, I'm an urban planner by training. So like, I have an immense amount of respect for the work that you all do and the limitations that you work under and the immense amount of work that we've put on all of you. Yet, this process has felt to me like we have, a, as Mr. Harris Dawson said, a failure of imagination. Like there's gotta be a better way to do this that gets us to the outcomes that we need because it feels at this point that no one is happy neither the hosts that are currently renting, the people who live around these um, short-term rentals, or the broader public. And I think we can do a much better job of addressing it, and we must. So um, I'm gonna read these instructions. I apologize for how long they are, but um, that's just where we are. So uh, I'm asking the CAO in, consul in consultation with city planning, um, Department of Building and Safety, Housing Department, um, and any other relevant departments to report back on options and what it would actually look like to create a single office division or department dedicated to home sharing administration and enforcement, party house enforcement, um, and enforcement for other related commercial activities on residential properties. This should include a recommended organizational structure, staffing and funding, as well as a recommended fee and fine structure to effectively resource the program. I'm gonna ask the Department of Building and Safety and the Housing Department and any other relevant departments to report back on additional information and recommendations regarding staffing needs for home sharing enforcement, including complaint-based, systems-based, document-based, um, health, safety, and compliance inf inspections, investigations for code violations, nuisance activities, and fraud, including related to claims of primary residents, citation issuances, and transfer of responsibility for complaint investigation and citation defense from city planning. I'm gonna ask the Department of City Planning to report back with an evaluation on the current contract agreement and scope of work with our contracted third-party vendor that provides a registration and compliance monitoring system to ensure that are these contractual obligations being met? Are there other providers who can offer relevant services based on the city's needs uh, that may have improved capabilities to eliminate non-compliant listings and ensure proper monitoring and tracking and to verify the collection of fines? I'm also gonna instruct the Department of Planning to report back on some of the things that you asked, uh, you recommended in the, in the report. Um, so I would love for you to report back on the feasibility of removing notices of code violation or warning letters to owners of non-compliant properties, uh, removing currently accepted home sharing registration documents that are easy to falsify, and how we could replace them with more trustworthy documentation, uh, like documentation from the DMV or the County Office of the Assessor to establish primary residence, um, how we could terminate home sharing permits on the transfer of ownership and tenancy, how we can issue home sharing tenants, uh, permits after six months of tenancy has been established at a primary residence and how feasible that would be, adding a new field in the current public home sharing portal or MyLA311 that would make it possible for members to submit time sensitive evidence and materials um, for registered and unregistered short-term rentals to accompany their complaints, um, adding a new subfield labeled HSO under the housing section in ZMUS to detail whether a property has a home sharing permit or not, and if it does, including the permit expiration date, and updating uh, the council file 14-1635-S12 related to including a private right of action clause on the home sharing ordinance. 
And then finally, uh, I'm going to ask the city attorney to report back on a number of questions that have come up today. Methods to expand the enforceability of the HSO, I, whether under the current ACE program or otherwise, including the ability to initiate enforcement based on evidence from members of the public, which is what we talked a lot about today. Amendments needed to authorize city personnel with enforcement powers to enter and inspect a property with appropriate notice and any required warrants to inspect, investigate, and abate bad faith, nuisance, illegal use provisions, permit violations, health and safety compliance, and HSO violations. Options to incentivize or require standard platform agreements and third-party broker master agreements for all platforms operating in the city of Los Angeles or advertising property for lease or rental within the city. An update on the constitutional provisions and other laws affecting the city's ability to regulate these platforms under the HSO and other similar ordinances, including recommendations on possible options to mandate data sharing by platforms, users, and advertisers, um, and recommendations for fines and other potential remedies for home sharing violations, including, for example, increased fines for repeat offenders uh, that could help us deter continued illegal short-term rental activity. Um, and finally, for LAHD to report back on how residential hotels are defined, uh, current enforcement approaches for this use of, um, uh, of properties and recommendations for stricter enforcement approaches for this protected housing stock. I think that encompasses uh, all of the questions that we've had, um, uh, but Ms. Rodriguez, you had a comment. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll second, but I uh, would like to offer a friendly uh, amendment to your first and second instruction. Uh, uh, on the first to uh, have the CLA. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes. To, I apologize. Uh, I was yeah. supposed to say that. Yeah. So uh, that the CLA uh, CAO in consultation. Perfect. Yes. And then uh, also for the second, same. Uh, the C having the CLA as the lead agency. The lead agency. Okay. I'm and fine then with that. on the um, in the final uh, sentence of the first uh, instruction, this should include the permitting process. Um, Council approved under the responsible hotel order. Perfect. Yes. I apologize. I was supposed to include those and I didn't. Um, so with that, I think you had a comment. Yeah. Well, just the, one of the last things to add into the, what we were talking about. Something maybe in the instructions to also on the re regarding the feasibility of of using an incentive program that would uh, harness the public's interest. Uh, you know, a, 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 and. An incentive, a financial incentive program that would allow, that would enable the public to participate in the uh, identification. Root, root, identification or rooting out of, of problematic or, or, or illegal. And to which department would you like to ask that question? Uh, well, I guess city planning, because that's city where planning. the the okay. big the big that's one fine. is. But so whoever we, want, we could here. we could throw it to all departments. I'm happy okay. to have the city attorney look at it as well. Okay. Okay. Um, and what I would like to do is to have these questions answered in our next committee meeting. I know that these are a lot of questions. You already have the answers to most of these. Um, we just need them more concretely than we've had them. Um, like I, this process has gone on for a very long time. When we've asked for additional information, when we asked for the original motion to move forward, that report took an extraordinary amount of time. When we asked for supplemental information, that supplemental information also took an extraordinary amount of time. I know everybody's very busy, but we really need to move forward on this. I know we can do this better. We have an ordinance that broadly makes sense for the city. We have an ordinance that we need to function accurately. Um, and we can get there. We just have to move a little faster and we need concrete answers to these questions. Yes? Um, Madam Chair, thank you. It's uh, Robert Gillardi, Director, Code Enforcement Housing Department. Just like to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Frank Lara Aww. for his over 25 years of civil service. Mr. No. Frank Lara's soon to retire. No. Frank, thank you so much. I wasn't sure if that was public yet, Mr. Lara, so I didn't want to. I didn't want to bring attention to it, but. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. It's been wonderful having a career with Building and Safety, and then most recently working uh, with all of you and your staff. They've been they've been so professional and courteous. It's uh, really made uh, my time enjoyable. But thank you very much. We're gonna miss you. We're gonna miss you, Mr. Lara. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you all. So with that, we'll bring this back to our next meeting. Lots of questions to be answered. Thank you all so much for your work.
Madam Chair, uh, would you like to, to take a vote? Oh, we do we need to vote? Okay. Yes, and the recommendation is to approve the amended recommendations as stated into the record by Council Members Rahman, Rodriguez, and Bloomfield. Does the committee wish to note and file the Department of City Planning reports dated October 4, 2023 and March 13? We're going to hold that. We're going to hold the Got report, it. not note and file it. Yeah. Okay. So do we need to call the roll? Uh, if you wish to uh, approve these recommendations uh, as amended. Sure. Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. He's absent. Absent. For eyes, uh, this item is approved as amended. Okay, okay. All right. And with that, I believe this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all.